Okay, we are live on YouTube, and we are live on Collaborate. So I'll turn the recording on. Uh, yeah, let's go. Let's just go. What we do? We're going to go through the material for this. Uh, at the end, I'll do a separate uh, recording for uh, more information about the test for you guys. There's, um, I've had a, a few emails with people. Uh, the first thing you're aware of that I've extended it, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in particular bits of content because we get through this one. Um, kind of unfortunately, both this topic and the one before it from last week, so vitiating factors and um, discharge. So basically how contracts end. Um, this is a, a pretty big component, um, probably the largest component. And it's really important as part of, um, really as, in terms of private lawmaking in business, what happens when a validly formed contract goes bad, when people don't do what they say they're going to do, what happens? And uh, throughout the, the previous three or four weeks, I've talked about the fact these things have legal consequences um, for non-performance. And we're going to talk about uh, what those consequences are. Um, so this bit, my little pie chart, has only the word discharge, but it's really do, doing remedies as well. Because the... Um, the remedies, what happens when a contract breaks, um, it sort of uses a similar set of remedies uh, when we go through and, and do that. Okay, how do contracts end? Uh, a variety of different ways. The uh, uh, You would think that the easiest one of these would be people doing what they say they're going to do. And the vast bulk of contracts end that way. Uh, the two parties agree to do something, agree to perform, um, what have we got in the class today? Uh, I won't be going to pick on people, but if Hina has a boat, I have $8,000. I want a boat, she wants $8,000. We swap, we exchange, both pieces of constitution uh, consider, consideration are executed. Our obligations end, and so does the contract. And this is a little different when you go to the supermarket. Remember that I we talked about this uh, the other week. When you, when I go and I pay my money to buy my can of cola, all of my obligations cease at that point. I paid my money. My consideration is executed. The other side, that while you know, the main thing they have to do is to give me the can of cola or whatever I've bought, but their um, guarantees, consumer guarantees, those linger for some period longer. Um, through finally being extinguished um, through the limitation of actions period of time. So you can't sue in contract law for um, six years after a breach. Okay, so um, what you find though is that this area of discharging through things performance, I mean, it sounds really simple. Both sides do what they said they're going to do, but there's actually a little bunch of sort of sub rules that say, look, we're still going to allow this contract to end through performance, the court saying, um, with a little bit of modification. Um, but fundamentally though, the courts want people to make contracts and they want people to do what they promise to do. And so the rules for discharging through performance is really an acknowledgement that when people do things, you know, they can get most of the way and it's not worth the while of, of the courts to get in the way if if things are minor in regards to that. And so that, that um, and again, my um, students last year, my undergrad students had a real hard time with trying to understand this distinction between a contract that's discharged to performance and that which is discharged through breach. In other words, where one or sometimes both parties uh, don't do what they say they're going to do. And so that it's from that point, it's trying to work out, well, what's actually going to happen? What do the, does the good guy, the innocent party get? in regards to a particular breach. So we have to go through and look at that. Now, sometimes contracts can be um, can be ended, or one mechanism of ending that, is if one or both sides don't want to do it anymore. Um, it's not to say there's not going to be consequences. And in fact, this idea of repudiation is really just this clear demonstration that one side just doesn't want to be bound um, by the by the contract anymore um, and that happens we think about that in terms of our life people give you the one-fingered salute and uh, and so that you as the innocent party have got some options 
you get some uh, some choices to make. And I think it's important for you guys as business students, um, you know, going out and making strategic business decisions, that you're aware of these options. And I've said for a long time that this particular uh, lecture is probably the most important one um, for the purposes of probably this whole subject. It's the, probably what I'm probably the one I enjoy the most as well uh, because it has real um, uh, real bits of information that you can go and make strategic business decisions from this point forward. It's um, These are really, really helpful rules to know. Okay, uh, how else can contracts end? Look, those, those three at the top, they're the big three. Um, the bottom four don't come up as much. I mean, parties can both agree to end contracts, and I'll explain that. It's actually not quite as simple as, as it sounds, but th they can do that. There is a doctrine which is particularly topical, um, where some sort of supervening event unforeseen by the parties can impact on a contract. We call this the doctrine of frustration. And at the moment, the world is going through this. Um, so this particular um, this particular moment, in, in, well, certainly in, in our lifetimes, is the moment where many a contract may be going in, or <laughs> many a... Um, an, a person that st studied business law is going back through their notes and through their old textbooks to go through and read about the doctrine of frustration. So we're going to talk about that, and it's a little bit more relevant uh, for this lecture more than it has been for generations. Uh, and finally, operation of law. So certain, um, uh, usually statutory mechanisms that'll go through and end these things. So without any ado, we'll start with the first. So just just note, we're going to do discharge, and then uh, uh, towards the end, uh, probably the final. 40 minutes or so, we'll talk about remedies and some specific rules for, for remedies. So we're going to start though, and you've got to appreciate this distinction that said the undergrads had a real hard time with between discharge through performance and the rules we're going to learn, and then breach. So let's go through with this one. Okay, because the default rule huh. to discharge a contract, to in other words, do um, what you say you're going to do is exactly that you have to do precisely what you said you were going to do to end your liability under a contract. So this uh, case of, of Cutter and Powell is the source of this rule, but it's actually quite a sad case. Um, a crewman was paid uh, a lump sum. I think it was a little bit upfront, but the, the remainder of it was paid or due to be paid after he did a whole trip. And the trip was to go from Portsmouth, I think, somewhere in, the, in England, to uh, Jamaica and back again. Sure, not a drama. Well, it kind of was a bit of a drama because 80% of the way through, so gone there, gone most of the way back, and he died. And so this, the issue were for the court when the action was brought on behalf of the widow was should she receive some sort of pro rata amount and the court said, and this seems a little bit harsh, but the court said, no, no, you can't. This contract required a person to go from A to B and then back from B to A in order to get paid. If the person uh, didn't want to or was unable to do that thing, they have not discharged their contractual obligations and therefore the um, in this particular case, the widow couldn't sue. Uh, sounds a little bit harsh, and it is, but I think it's a useful starting point because you know, the rule of Carter and Powell is the starting point for discharge for performance. All of these other rules that we're going to talk about, there are exceptions to that. Uh, and the first exception is to do with trivial uh, variations in performance. We call this the de minimis non curat lex rule, or just the de minimis rule. And that, that is the idea that the courts just don't care about tiny amounts. And so the Shipton Anderson and Wheel Brothers case involved uh, a cargo load of like 10,000 tons of wheat or the equivalent in uh, modern day in, met in the metric system. Huge amount. And, um, and there was a, a clause in there to do with variance. You know, you can have plus or minus whatever it was, 5%. And hilariously, the... Um, the people delivering it um, was what had happened. The price of wheat went down. So the people 
uh, the buyers were really trying to get out of this contract. And one of the things they did after measuring it all, they said that, look, we've measured the amount and we're taking the 5%, all right? And you are over by some absurdly small amount, like 10 kilos. So the thing was for like 10,000 tons and they were like 10 kilos beyond the accepted uh, limit. And, and let's be clear, they delivered too much and they weren't being paid for it. Just stop and think about that for a second. They delivered too much. So outside, there was an amount that was to deliver and it had a plus or minus clause. And they were just outside of that. By the, they said the equivalent of about 10 kilos. And, um, and they tried to argue that this um, the other side didn't discharge your obligation through performance. Uh, what do you think the court said? The court told them to go away and said, look, you know, trifling matters. Um, it's just not relevant for a court. Uh, the court does not concern itself with trifles, is the phrase they use from that. So this is the, the first exception to, uh, to the de minimis rule. So Cutter and Powell, for example, um, if the, um, oh, I don't know, the same example had been the, um, uh, the crewman went all the way to Jamaica and then went all the way back, and when it was in the, I don't know, the, the boat had docked, and then the guy went off before uh, a few minutes before he was supposed to. The courts would just say, "Look, that's that's trivial. It's just a trivial uh, defect." All right. Now, um, what happens though as these amounts get a little bit bigger um, requires a little bit more analysis. But the the thing to note is that the courts like to see themselves as the upholder of bargains. They want contracts to be formed. And they don't want contracts to be pulled apart easily. But there's a very pragmatic rule. They've said that, look, in situations where a contract can be segmented, if you can chop it up into separate obligations, each one of those is capable of being analysed. And most importantly, where the parties have done and completed. So, for example, the delivering of goods, um, deliver, uh, say, uh, uh, Tala. Oh, good, because I was about to call you out. Question. Um, is the visible obligations part of performance still? Yes, definitely. So, they're all the first of what, seven or eight sl slides are to do with discharge of performance. It's that idea that if, for example, if you and I had a contract and the contract was for me to purchase. A uh, hundred thousand dollars worth of footwear, a deliverable each month for, um, you know, each, each month you were going to deliver me a certain number of shoes. All right, say I don't know, thousand pairs of shoes. The whole contract was for a year, and it was one hundred twenty thousand dollars, but payable monthly. So ten thousand dollars a month, and you would deliver a fixed number of shoes in each. Uh, each uh, each month. And so what the court says is that, look, where you've got a contract like that, sure, it says $120,000, but by default, again, unless the parties have carefully mapped out what the consequences are going to be for delivery and non-delivery, but by default at common law, the courts are saying, well, look, you've got $120,000 contract. Um, say you you know you deliver them for seven months and then you're like, no, I don't want to do the rest. What the courts will say is that, look, that first seven months, You've delivered the shoes. I've accepted them. We've discharged our obligations for each of those months. We're only going to be analysing five months worth of non-delivery and five months worth of uh, essentially of breach at that particular point in time. Um, and that's really to try and chop things up. So we're not going through the kind of silly situations with the courts where we're um, I've already paid, been paid some amount, but I'm trying to sue for the whole lot, and then of course I have to deduct the amounts already been paid and you know, do. I have to give back all of the shoes that you've already delivered. They're not going to worry about that. They're going to muck around. They're going to say, look, you, this was fine up until this point. As such, we're going to use our power to interpret this and say that, look, this aspect of the contract, the first seven months, has been discharged through performance. Both sides' contractual obligations uh, cease at that stage and you can't sue for breach. It's really, these are very practical, pragmatic rules because they're designed for people of business to sort things out themselves. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's a really important thing to note with particularly this, the, you know, the first sort of seven or eight slides, which is to do with um, uh, discharge through, essentially through performance.
So the next bit is, is oh, look, what happens if one side, and again, we're thinking of a, of a contract, has done a chunk of work, but there's definitely some form of noticeable defect. Okay, there's going to be some defect in a piece of work. Now, again, as a self-help remedy, the courts have developed this idea of, of discharge through substantial performance. What that means is that if you are, for example, uh, the buyer or uh, the person who's engaged somebody for contract for service or for labor, if they've gone and s substantially completed the work, so, you know, by and large, you, you know, you're, you're happy with it, they've largely done it, but there are, they reckon they're finished and you reckon there's some minor defects and, and most importantly, you haven't paid yet. As a practical rule, what do you guys think the um, the person paying ought to do? This is a moral question, even though it's written on the slides what the law is. Pay, pay the whole lot? I mean, if it's something substantial, yeah. then they go back to the visible obligations. Mm -hmm. If it's something, uh, if it's something like, you know, massive, if something's mm -hmm. not, yep. then it's, it's good thinking. Price, yep. Cool. It's good thinking. Uh, I think it's, um in some contracts though, it's difficult to, um, uh, it's difficult to, to work out whether things can be divided or not. So if we're just looking at one piece of work, you know, what's your question? Um, yeah, 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 that's right. Usually, I mean, there's consumer law here as well. But we're just leaving that aside. But assuming that there is some minor defect, in, and certainly in this case of Honing and Isaacs, it's the situation where the builder has done something, right, done substantial piece of work. They've done almost everything, but there's some tangible defect, and they're either unwilling or don't think that there's a defect, and the other side has said, well, there is a defect and I can prove it. So what do they do? They pay, or in this case, they paid the amount of the whole contract less the cost of remedying the defect. This is a self-help remedy. This is designed for business people to sort things out themselves. And it's really important that you note that contracts themselves can have particular clauses in them to map out what's going to happen for all these things. So this is assuming this contract doesn't have these sorts of clauses. As a self-help practical um, mechanism, you can invoke the doctor of substantial formats and say, look, this contract was for $10,000 um, for you to repair my kitchen. You've done you know, almost all, everywhere is a good job, but you didn't put any trim on the edges of the, uh, of the things. I've had to go buy some trim cost me $50, I'm paying you $9,950. Tala. So what if, let's say, that the tasks that haven't been done um, can't be quantified for sure. So it, it can't be like, you know, six screws, five things, yep. and it's an estimate. Yes. Then who estimates? Is it the building? The, the, the the, it's the person not paying has to do an estimate. And this is one of those things, and we'll talk later about breach. Uh, the idea here is that you have to be reasonable. Um, you have to make a reasonable estimation of what these things are. And the best way to do that <laughs> is to go and get two quotes. It's a very common thing in Queensland, by the way. If ever you uh, have a car crash or anything along those lines, and you're trying to determine how much uh, a particular amount is going to cost to remedy a certain defect, go and get quotations as part of that process. That's really the key, the key aspect to it because it's a, it's going to be an issue of evidence. You're going to have to prove this to the court. Hina. Can I ask one thing? Yeah, sure, sure. If there is a dispute between, uh, you know, uh, the part that has to pay for the job and the part that did the job, yeah. one rest in the job has not been done properly, another one, you know, opposite, no? Yeah. If, uh, the one part cannot not pay everything and go straight to court, no, you can. Now there is, and we've got some um, issues there. The thing is, is, if you are not paying, so you're just determined to not pay a particular contract, that's what's called repudiation. So we'll get to that. That's that's a uh, can be its own problem a little bit later on. But for this bit, this is assuming that the parties are actually seeking 
to finish it now without having to go to court. Because the thing is about breach, and the, the super, super important point is that when you are trying to determine the amount of when when there's a breach of contract, which can be either through repudiation or through actual breach, um, which we'll do in the second half of this lecture, when you're doing that, only the court can work that out. Okay? Only the court really can go through and do that. What these rules are, are self-help mechanisms. They're sort of practical mechanisms for the parties to discharge their contractual obligations through trying to use, in some ways, a little bit of common sense. Um, and so this is, and again, Honing and Isaacs, by the way, and Bolton and Matt David, they're both building uh, contracts in England, not for huge sums of money. And in both situations, there was a defect afterwards. Um, and the important distinction between them is that in Honing and Isaacs, there was only a small amount as a fraction of the contract, maybe you know, 5% of the contract. The builders had come in, uh, renovated the townhouse, and there, there, was, there were some defects. And the, um, the plaintiff was able to prove this. They actually go and say, hey, look, there, um, there were some defects. I went and paid a different contractor to fix those defects. Here's the information for that. I paid them the contract amount, less the amount to remedy. And the court said, yeah, that's fine. That, that, that's sensible. However, in Bolton and Mahadeva, this involved a um, uh, again, also renovation thing, but involved the installing of a central heating system. What they found there is that, look, the central heating system worked sometimes, and then it didn't. And then it would be too hot, and then it would be too cold. Sometimes it would stall, sometimes it would uh, run all day. They couldn't, they couldn't really work out how and where it was failing. And the courts there said that, look, this is a failure really across the whole, um, whole contract itself. It's not. Um, that you've substantially completed the work, you really haven't. It didn't meet that threshold. And as such, the um, you can't really use these rules. You have to use the rules for breach, which you'll get to. So it's, it's really here trying to determine with small amounts and leave that on the back of your mind because from this point forward, if you are the person who's contracted with somebody for them to do a packet of work, you always want to make sure you're being reasonable when doing this and saying that, hey, uh, particularly if the parties have said, they've said we're finished, you've said they haven't finished, getting a third person to go and look at it and say, is it reasonable to think this has been done or not? Usually, that um, the person's doing it are other craftspeople in the same trade. And they'll be able to usually see you're right. And again, part of that is get two quotes. Does this require extra work? If they say yes, go and get a quote, to, uh, two quotes, to make sure you're, um, you're on the right track for doing it. But fundamentally, though, this is still a, a, the law of the land. These cases will both apply um, for contract law in Australia. Okay, um, next one. So that's that's the doctrine of substantial performance. Now, there is a bit of a minor rule. This this doesn't come up much. I'll talk about it, but it doesn't come up much. All right, and it's to do with uh, what we call accepting of partial performance. It's basically where one side usually does some form of labour. All right, so the They've done some labor, and then for whatever reason, they've disappeared. Okay, this is a little bit of a corner case. Done some work, disappeared, um, and for example, uh, let's say, uh, Enrico, I'm building your house. And so you've put down, I've put down a slab, and I've put in a shed. Shed's probably a better example. Um, uh, I've put, the, the, put down the slab, I've started doing the thing, I've put the bolts in, uh, and then I'm just like, oh, no, I don't want to do this anymore. You don't worry, you don't have to pay me. I'm just disappearing. All right. What the court says is that, look, um, if a person does that, right, usually there would be no remedy. But the court said in situations, and this is a narrow, narrow, narrow case where the person who's received the benefit, so in other words, in this case, uh, I'm building your house. If you, I've started to build your shed. Um, if you voluntarily accept the work that's been done. Again, this is kind of a weird um, rule for performance. If you And, and again, this, this idea of voluntariness is important. So in the case of the, the slab, I've put the slab in, you know, the only thing you could do would be to pull these bolts out, which is not really reasonable at all. So that you carrying on building the shed um, probably isn't voluntary in that situation. Yeah, but if you thought, okay, that's cool, it's fine. The guy's done the bolt work, he's done the form work, that's cool, I'll just carry on. Um, in that situation, you 
the, if I'd come back, you know, six months later and said, oh, can you pay me for that formwork and, that, and those bolts? Uh, I actually can make a claim, not for the contract amount, but for a reasonable amount. Um, the, the, the courts um, the courts let parties go through and claim that um, as part of it. Like I said, it's a bit of a corner case. That's just what the... Can I ask Sorry? Can I ask for just a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. This one halfway leave me, you know, he said I'm done. Yeah. Is damaging me because I can't respect the deadline or things like that. That's a mean even if I can even accept because if uh, you know if I don't accept what I can do. It's um it's usually things like this. The reason why this is rare that this comes up is that it's usually where you haven't got any form of um of system in place for periodic paying, which under the um, statutory framework, the building uh, industry, uh, it's, it's like period payments, the BSIPA, Building Industry and Construction Payments Act, I think it's called, um, that has a system in place for milestones, doing certain things and, and being able to claim to get paid at each of those milestones. It's actually quite heavily governed by statute these days. Uh, and um, so that something as large as the stadium um, has got the, you know you'll have the parties that are doing that have got very very well mapped out contractual instruments this rule really applies for people where they haven't gone and mapped out all of those scenarios and so they're just using the, the rules of common law to fill in the gaps um, literally me rocking over to your house and starting to build your shed um, assuming we've got no written agreement whatsoever um, and look, that can happen. People can go through and do these things. And you often find that there's rules like this that appear in, in low and small sort of courts, which is why these are self-help remedies. So just make note, if somebody does do work for you and then they just disappear, um, always make sure you can demonstrate that you're accepting the work reluctantly. You're not voluntarily saying, oh, cool, here's the work, I'll just keep it. Um, doing software, for example. Um, if you, if, you know, I came, built, built you uh, some sort of software and then just went away, uh, didn't ask for any money, just went away, you and you voluntarily just determined that you're going to keep it, you're probably going to have to pay some amount later on. Leave that one in the back of your mind. Uh, whereas if you have to keep it, for example, built this thing and now I'm using it as my cust main customer um, relationships management software, well, y you know, you, it may not be, um, it may not be voluntary in that case. So that's that's just the word they use to describe that. Look, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm not understanding. Um, you're saying that uh, the one for person A is a poor remedy. Yep. And then for person B, in case of if I knew of your bond, but now I'm going to do the work yep. on a voluntary basis. Then when the person A comes back, you're supposed to compensate that person A for yes. what he has done? Yep, that's the point. No, 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 no. No, 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 stop, 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 stop. Not for whatever they've done. You're supposed to compensate them for a reasonable amount. That's not for what they've done. No, no, that's that's not that's not it here. It's a reasonable amount. So they have to go to the court, and the court has to determine what that amount is. It'll always be lower than the amount under a, a contract. All right, so it's a reasonable amount. Usually, um, something like the minimum wage. So that that's that's part and parcel, and it only applies if the person. Um, voluntarily accepts the work. It's not going to apply if they have really no choice but to carry on building the shed or no choice but to carry on using that piece of software. It's not going to apply in that situation. Um, that's it. Okay. This, it's a bit of a corner case. It doesn't come up much. All right. Uh, these things can come up though. Um, this is what we call thwarting performance. Um, and this is where one side is... Uh, Yes, Abhishek, how are you? Question? Oh. Hello, hello. I'm going to mute you. Can you hear me? It's better now. Better now. It's, um, it was having a, a lot of feedback. Alan? Yeah. Alan? It's good now. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I did a contract to a, to a company, say, ABC. Mm -hmm. 
is he considered a consultant? Yep. Okay. In the contract scope, as we are giving the example of building the house. Yep. The contract is uh, to erect the house and give it in lock and key condition. Yeah. However, due to some circumstances, UBC consultant starts the business. Shall I shall? Yeah, so they've they've um so they've got they've been in, in they're in liquidation. Maybe yes. Sure. Liquidation or, yep. Or some legal dispute between uh, the partners of the company. Or sure. Uh, yep. And so they just they just stop working. They stop work. Yes. Sure. They're not working. Yep. Yep. Uh, in that case, in such a situation, hmm. uh, how does this payment part work? What what do we take into consideration? There's a couple of things here. First of all, the um the rule from the previous slide probably wouldn't apply in that situation because if a company is going into liquidation, it's very very rare that they'll just abandon a contract. Also, most building contracts have uh, systems of the peri as you mentioned periodic payments, and they'll have clauses in those contracts saying that certain amounts are paid, and certain amounts won't be paid if things are beyond a certain point. So in other words, if you take too long, they'll have what's called pre-estimated damages clauses in there as well. So it's rare that, that entities in that situation are going to abandon contracts. That's why that, that rule is quite a rare rule because it's in situations where the parties haven't mapped out what's going to happen if you're late or if you disappear and it's where one side abandons. They actually just say, no, nah, I'm done and just disappear. Um, so they look like they've just abandoned the contract altogether. Um, that's the... Um, uh, and I said, it's a pretty rare situation that that'll come up. It's a pretty corner case rule. Uh, we'll get to breach, though, in terms of that in a few more slides. But, um, Alan. You're okay? All right. Uh, so a couple of things, though. When you are, when the sides have started performing, it's a really important thing to note that if you are actually getting in the way of the other party or trying to in some way stop them the word we use is thwart if you're thwarting their performance uh they can sue, sue you for breach of contract as well um, so you just got to make note in terms of uh when parties are going and trying to perform in contract that this that you have to let them give them a um uh you know a fair go a fair berth or you have to help them or support them um, as part of that. And one of them that, that comes up is with the sale of goods. Um, it's where goods have been um, not accepted. So, or, so or we use the phrase wrongfully refused. So I've gone, delivered some goods to, um, I can go back to Tala with the shoes, got my monthly um, delivery of goods for $10,000 worth, go on and drop them off. And she just says, nah. Um, uh, so just as a small note there, I don't have to come back the next day and try again. All right, from that point in time, if there's been uh, non-acceptance, I can then terminate and seek and um, possibly terminate. But usually at that particular point in time, I can sue. I'll get a, the right to sue for breach. Uh, another thing can happen when um, it's pointless. So when the other side says to, to you, look, don't bother turning up. I'm not going to accept it. That's also okay. You don't have to turn up. If the other side say, or contact you and say, I'm not going to accept the goods. Just from that point in time, they're demonstrating that they don't want to do, do that. So you don't have to actually perform. So normally, you have to do things to um, help the other side. Not, not you know, strictly speaking, go to their workplace and help them physically do things. But you can't um, hinder them. You can't try and stop them from performing. If I've got a, uh, a contract with uh, Abhishek for him to, um, I don't know, drive... Uh, deliver a house like one of those house demountable houses um, deliver a house to Charters Towers I can't just go and try and block up the road so that he delivers late and then has to pay me for um, for being late because that we've got a clause in the contract you can't do that Alan nope okay all right so that's um the, the, these are the core aspects of um of performance you need to know um there is a couple of terms that I'll just mention here um which is uh actually yeah, probably important to know before we move on to um uh, the next one which is through bridge and these are these what we call conditions conditions precedent and conditions subsequent so let's just say uh, uh Alma and me have got a contract where I will go um I own some goods that are coming in a boat all right and Elmer is going to unload those goods at the dock and so what we say there is that look 
my performance, which is to pay you, um, I could either pay you at the start, I could pay you at the end, um, we can map out how that works. But your performance is, um, is contingent. It's contingent on something happening. That is, it's contingent on the boat actually arriving. If the boat never arrives, you can't fulfill your obligations. And those contingencies can only last uh, for a reasonable length of time as well. Um, and so just note, this, this idea of contingencies don't last forever. They'll um, wear a, a contingencies in place, so you know, um, uh, deliver the, um, you know, get the goods off the boat, and then coronavirus has come, so there's no boats coming for 12 months. Well, the courts are going to look at the circumstances there to determine, well, is that so long? That, that contingency is essentially going to be to just extinguish that particular performance and just discharge it through performance. Um, that's really up for the court to, to uh, continue uh, to determine. But no, that reasonable length of time, it depends on industry, the type of goods, um, a variety of factors they'll take into account when doing that. Okay, look, the rules for performance. Tala. Yep. It says, let's say, from point A to point B, there's one contingent plan. To point uh, B to point C, there's one. Yep. There's E to F, there's yep. two. Yep. So what if some of them are, some of them are not? Yep. The courts will just go through and ideally try and split these things out because each term which is uh, which you're looking at and analyzing, each of them is going to last for a reasonable length of time. So the courts is going to determine, well, this one may be extinguished because it's been three years, for example. This one, um, it, you know, the... Uh, come and pick up this, um, these ice creams. You know, I've got a cargo load of ice creams. A reasonable length of time for is going to be a very, very short period of time. Whereas, um, come and yeah, I said come and when uh, the next cruise ship, come and deliver these things to this cru the next cruise ship that comes into Townsville. You know, cruise ships are not really much of a thing at the moment. Uh, so that the courts might just say no. That's we're just going to say that that. Um, that particular uh, term is going to be just discharged. We're just not going to um, deal it. Now, it's not to say that there won't, won't be consequences um, for doing these things. I'll we'll explain the rules for restitution at, at the end. But strictly speaking, that um, those conditions that never get fulfilled are, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're just considered to be discharged for the purpose of analyzing the contract because you analyze each term and, and each prospective breach separately. Okay. So that umbrella is the um is really all of the rules for discharging contracts through performance this one is probably the biggest one which is through breach um and that uh, is um uh is where people don't do or can't do or doesn't look like they're going to fulfill their obligations and there is one Super duper duper important rule in contract law. There's a few of them. In fact, in fact, in this entire class, if there's like ten things you've got to remember, uh, this is probably one of them. And that when somebody breaches a contract, the innocent party always gets the right to sue. Breach of contract is strictly speaking unlawful. And importantly, in that first phrase we read reading at the top, discharge um, occurs when a party contract either fails to perform, demonstrates an unwillingness to perform. Uh, does that have any um, reference to fault? It definitely, definitely doesn't. Failing to perform your contractual duties is independent of fault. It does not matter how or why you didn't do what you promised to do. The courts do not care. It's a huge fundamental rule, very, very important principle that fundamentally, when you sign up to do contracts and you don't do it, you're going to have to compensate the other side. They, when contracting with you, don't need to, and the courts don't take into account any of your personal circumstances. They don't care if you're having marital issues. They don't care if you've got mental health problems. They don't care if um, you know, your car broke down. It doesn't matter. One side doesn't do what they say they're going to do the innocent party gets the right to sue for damages, to sue, okay? Just gets the right to sue. Now, we're going to have to quantify that, or qual we'll qualify the statement and quantify the amount. But this word damages is a, um, uh, it's a technical legal term 
to describe money, particularly a money award, amount of money which is awarded to a party who wins in court. So if you hear that phrase, me use the phrase damages from now on, that is what I'm referring to. It is a common law concept for a money award that the court, when one side goes to, to, to court, the court says, yes, you didn't do what you said you're going to do. Uh, you're going to have to pay the plaintiff, the person who's bringing the action, a sum of money, even if it's a small amount. Okay, We call those nominal damages. Sometimes damage awards can be really, really small, but it's always something. That's, that's a, a really, really important point. Um, okay, so... Uh, first thing to note, what's the next thing to note? Next thing to note, oh yeah, when we're trying to characterize this, all right, this, we, the, a breach in terms of how serious it is, um, because this, like, the level of seriousness of the breach determines the consequences. Because while every breach of contract gives the innocent party the right to sue for damages, only what we call serious um, breaches, only big breaches, are going to give the innocent side the right to terminate, to end the contract at their choosing. Okay, and we call this test for working out whether or not a particular term that's been breached is serious, so serious that it's going to give the innocent side this right to terminate. Uh, we call this the test of essentiality. Okay, it's from um, Luna Park and Tramways. Um, Luna Park and Tramways was a case involving trams in Sydney. Uh, Luna, uh, tramways advertising were people that put signs on the side of trams. Okay, and the um, uh, the uh, Luna Park were doing some uh, advertisements on those. For Luna Park, it was a big theme park in Sydney. I don't think it still has one in Sydney, but they've got one in Melbourne and St Kilda. Uh, anyway, Luna Park had these advertisements on these uh, on these trams, and they said that these trams must be out on the um, uh, on the uh, on the streets of Sydney for eight hours each day. Does that sound very complicated? No, it doesn't sound very hard. So if it's a tram, it's it's on freight. Well, the trouble is with trams is that um, <laughs> you just think about how they work. They go here and there, and then usually at some stage, they stop. The driver gets out. The tram can be um, out of operation. You know, in other words, not be um, uh, facilitating the, uh, the, the, the strict eight-hour rules for the entire length of the day. And so what they, they worked out, and the court accepted this evidence that... Um, that tramways advertising did actually have a um, uh, have you know each individual sign and, and in aggregate across the entire network, yes, that they were um, each one was uh, uh, each individual sign wasn't out for eight hours, but on aggregate the signs were in and around the street for the number of signs times eight hours in terms of how they managed to do it. In other words, they were there for longer and so on. And so the courts, uh, either which way, when they, when um, uh, tram was advertising wanted, uh, sorry, Luna Park wanted out of this this contract. And so they sued and it went all the way to, the, I think they actually went to the Privy Council, uh, even though it's got a High Court um, CLR reference. And there they said that, look, um, in order to, uh, really characterize and determine what this, how where this particular contractual term is going to sit. Whether or, we have to work out um, whether or not both parties, and again considered objectively, so the courts don't work out what the actual parties thought. They work out what an objective bystander, objective third party would think. Would the parties have come together and formed this contract if? near exact performance wasn't going to be guaranteed. As if that particular term is going to um, wasn't going to be nearly perfectly performed, then that term is not going to be considered essential. So if and if you think about it, if the parties would never have come together to form a particular contract, then 
clearly those types of terms are going to be the important ones. Um, and so going back to the contract I have with Tala for the uh, $10,000 of shoes each month, so the month of August, um, we try and think about what's the really essential terms here. Um, from her perspective, there's, <laughs> there's really one thing. Did I pay or did I not? From my perspective though, you could probably make some more uh, deeper or richer thoughts. So for example, if I was to supply um, you know, women's shoes, a thousand uh, women's shoes, and then because she owns a women's shoe store, and then one month I decided to supply a thousand men's shoes, clearly when we came together to form this party, an objective bystander looking at this would have thought, well, there's no way they would have come together to form this uh, contract if that particular term was going to be... Um, uh, not going to be construed near exactly. Uh, and so that this um, this test, this test of essentiality, is basically the the test the courts use to determine whether a party is is essential. It's a it's a critical term. We call those a contractual condition, uh, which is unfortunate because that word has other meanings in English. And 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 a, a term which is non-essential. Is called a contractual warranty. So these are two words that we used. Condition, important term, warranty, less important term. Now, going back to that first important rule of contracts and breach, if either type of term is breached, the innocent side can get damages. But the really important thing is that a breach of warranty only gets you money. If you're the innocent party, the other side has breached a minor term, you can still sue, but you're only going to get money. Whereas for major terms, for contractual conditions, the innocent side can get money as well as the right to terminate, the right to end the contract at that particular point. Okay, uh, That's going to take a little bit of time to get your head around. Because only the courts do that. Only the courts can really you know, determine these things one way or the other definitively. But the key test they use is would an objective a bystander looking into this arrangement think that that particular term was so essential that if near exact performance wasn't guaranteed, the, the two parties would never have come together to form that contract. That's the test of essentiality. Okay, so... Con Again, from this time, I'll use the word contractual condition and contractual warranties. Conditions, major terms, give you the right to terminate if, if you're the innocent party. Whereas uh, contractual warranties only give you the, um, the right to seek damages. You don't get the right to terminate as part of that. Now, Abhishek, hi. Well, you always renegotiate. You're always allowed to do that. You can, um, and we'll get to that because that's um, this has through agreement. We can always choose to agree if we can come together, negotiate some things. There's also some other things here. So, in that situation, time, which is this next slide, is in most situations what we call an intermediate term uh, or an nominate term. In other words, that a minor breach of it is only going to be treated as a contractual warranty. 
and will not give you the right to terminate. So in the case of that example here, uh, it was quite a good one actually. Um, in 11 months, say you've got 11 months to um, to build uh, the, the house. And say the milestone is to literally have the house complete, completed and all finished in 11 months. All right. If you went over by one day, all right, over by one day, is this going to be um, a, like a significant thing? And it's like, well, it's still a breach if you go over by one day. And so the other side can seek compensation. So they can seek because it's going to be a breach of contractual warranty. But one day is usually not going to be a condition. I'll get to that. I've actually got some cases on, on point for this later on because it can be. Um, now, we, we call that an intermediate or an nominate term where in, in time being the classic is that, is that unless the parties have actually come together and said, no, time is of the essence, it must be done at this particular point in time. Um, and again, there's rules for that. If, it, if the parties don't talk about it, it's not considered to be of the essence. Time is not considered to be of the essence. So it, in this situation, assuming that we didn't map this out in the contract itself, one day, probably going to be and again, this is this innominate or intermediate term, going to be treated as contractual warranty. 11, or sorry, what was it, 20 months? Uh, taking an extra nine and a half months for an 11 month contract, that sounds like a really big, big breach of the contract. And so in that situation, we would say, look, the courts will probably consider that to be a, uh, essentially treated like a breach of condition. So the innocent party will get the right to terminate. And that's exactly what happened in this Hong, uh, Hong Kong fur shipping and, and Kawasaki Ka, Kaizen Keisha. Uh, it was to do with the um, uh, the lease of a boat. And the courts had to work out uh, for a two-year lease, the boat being unavailable for, I think it was 11 months, whether or not that was going to be, uh, <laughs> whether that, that was actually going to let the innocent party go through and... Um, and terminate. Um, so this length of time that the boat was was out of action because it was low quality. Uh, then of course, as you said, no in that situation. So look, you, you can um, things can be um, a little bit unexpected with that. And again, I'll come back to time as well uh, with that because time, you said, is usually not of the essence, but you can make it of the essence um, in in or well, in contract law by giving notice, which I think might be. The next slide, yeah, it is. Because, yes. Yeah, Abhishek? Yeah, so uh, now the counterpart to this question, I mean, the, uh, sure. the situation. So, for example, uh, after 18, 19 months, the, the second contracting company comes in and says, you know what, uh, we are aware that this uh, party ABC consultant has gone uh, uh, gone back, and now we are XYZ, we're taking over as per the contract. Sure. And these are the new uh, these are the yep. new prices that we will do the contract for. Yeah, the um, with all the raw materials. Yeah, the a third a third okay, couple of things. The third party isn't stepping into the shoes of the early one. That particular agreement, agreement and contract law, is only between the two parties. So it's a separate, distinct and different agreement with the guys that they you're getting in to come and fix the work. This contract is analyzed quite separate from this one. And so the, it's, it's called the doctrine of privity, um, that only the parties to a contract can sue or be sued on it. Um, now you can, with the assent of both parties, and this is the important word, you can do the process, what we call novation, which is to substitute a party in. You can go through and do that. Uh, it's the slide towards the end of this lecture. Um, it's quite rare that happens. Um, and, yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, so the, 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 the stepping in party uh, says, okay, we're ready with the raw material, the goods, the resources to take over the work. We're sorry for the delay. Sure. But this is the new negotiated price. At that moment, if I think that this renegotiated price is not just and fair, and I want mean. to cancel the contract, can the third consulting party do? I'm, I'm, tr I'm working out which one it is here. Uh, so if the first construction company isn't yeah. able to meet your... um your obligations to you, right? So I'm say so I, I I'm company A. I can't meet my obligations to you. That's fine, sure. So I'm I'm in breach, and we've we've determined 
that this the length of time we didn't in our contract say that it was essential so it's going to be a minor breach is going to be a contractual treated like a warranty a major breach is going to be treated like a breach of a condition here it's been you know an extra you know, 12 months um we've made the full call we think that that's that is a um it's going going to be a substantial length of time so we've said we terminate at this point in time all right and what happens at that point what the what you do in terms of going and uh, essentially trying to fix the work and carry on um, usually to what they call mitigate your loss I'll talk about that later today as well um, is the courts sort of say is that look strictly speaking I'm in breach I'm gonna to have to pay you money all right but you have to take some steps reasonable steps to mitigate the loss to me it's a little bit curious how that works um, and um, and the reason that is that otherwise it would be really inefficient to just wait until people go go to court and let buildings go to disrepair, assuming that the building that is built being built for you is going to be leased or is going to be used by you. In other words, it's going to become this economic asset. Hey guys, I just got to clear my throat for a second. <coughs> it usually means I've been talking too long. So that this um. Uh, so in, in that situation, um, you need to lease it out to someone. So you are suffering loss because you're not able to lease the building because it's been a year delay through through my, you know, essentially me not completing on time. So I'm in breach. You can terminate if you think it's been a length of time which was so substantial, um, as I said, that goes back to the previous slide, the nominate term. Um, and again, you have to double guess what the court would think. And this is why you should always, with these sorts of rules, go and ask someone who isn't invested in it because if you're wrong you're in breach by just kicking me out by just saying oh you no, we don't want you anymore and if the courts would say well actually no that was just um one year was only a breach of a warranty you're wrong you're you're the one who's in breach but um in that situation though you going and finding someone else to finish the work is a perfectly reasonable series of steps and even if it costs a little bit more all right that's the, the money you can still seek from me. Even if it costs you taking reasonable steps to mitigate my loss, if you end up hiring someone else to finish the work in order for you to then lease it to the you know, third party or whatever, whoever wanted the work, um, then that's fine. You can claim that all from me. But we'll get to that a little later on in terms of quantifying that. It's actually a different, um, it's a different area. This bit here though, is this, uh, we're talking about breach through delay. Remember I mentioned that time by, by default, is not an essential term, right? It's an anomalous term. Minor breach is only going to be treated like a breach of warranty. You're only going to get money. Major breach is going to be treated like a breach of condition. You get the right to terminate and the right to get damages. So you get money and this right to terminate. Now you can though put in the contract that time is of the essence. Parties can do that. When parties come together, they can determine to make time of the essence or not of the essence. Uh, that's what has a particular meaning. And if time is not of the essence, you can actually give notice to the other side making it of the essence if they're taking what seems to be too long. Um, now, in um, Union Eagle and Re Ronan, I'll start with Re Ronan. Re Ronan was a, um, a conveyancing uh, from the it was in Brisbane, it's in southeast Queensland, and it involved a firm of lawyers who were trying to do a conveyance on a Friday. And that Friday morning, the computers were all down. The, the property had to be done at five o'clock. The computers were all down, uh, and so they had to go into the uh, whatever is the the institute's uh, real estate institute's office, get the paperwork, and then they had to drive to the Gold Coast. And it was this huge, 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 huge electrical storm like that. So it's pouring with rain. It took them an, an absurd amount of time to get there. And so they arrived at, I think it was something like seven minutes past five, a really short amount, might've been 15 minutes, just a little bit after five o'clock. And the other side, who by this stage didn't actually want to be in the country, they were like, no, we're not doing it. We are not doing it. No, you're too late. Time was of the essence. We are going to terminate. So in that situation, yeah, I think I think it was something like seven minutes. You guys can go through and have a, have a read. Uh, and there, the court said, "Fair enough. Seven minutes. You're too late. Um, time was of the essence. 
this conveyance had to be done at five o'clock on this Friday. Uh, it's not. So title hasn't passed. No, it's it's time is of the essence. You've you're too late. The other side can treat this like a breach breach of condition and terminate. And what can you do as well? You can seek damages. So you terminate the contract. Don't convey the land. Not going to go through a settlement. And you can seek compensation from them because you're the innocent party. Okay, that's how that that is how that one works. So time can be construed very, very narrowly. And all of these things are best done through the parties carefully going through and mapping stuff out. And so with, with all of these rules, you can go through, map it out, and you can go through, uh, in this case here, if the... Um, if the the particular contract doesn't say that time's essential, and most contracts don't, um, and again going back to Abhishek's uh, construction contract, if after um, I'm in breach, okay, and so I'm in breach. So look at these rules. So this is the tropical rules and tropical traders down there. If I'm in breach, in other words, I've taken too long. You going to give me notice to make time of the essence because what's the purpose of doing that if time is of the essence you can terminate so remember how you said you had the um, me carry on working and carry on working and carry on working and a whole year went by right and before you just cracked it and lost it okay what you guys should do from this point forward as business people and again this these rules are this is the law of the land you'd be wise from this point for some of these rules to actually tuck this stuff in your head because this will come up. You'll be involved in making strategic business decisions and knowing how and where these rules work is really, really important because when you go, you know, contact your solicitor, they'll, they'll say, did you give them notice? And you'll go, what? And you can go back, dust out your old business law textbook um, because by default, and you should do this whenever you guys have gone through and done um, things like residential property and stuff, and or you're buying large, large things, go through and find out where the time is of the essence in that contract, okay? Because you can, even after the contract is formed, if the other side is in breach, in other words, they've taken too long, you are what we call ready, willing, and able to perform. In other words, you're not substantially disabled. Um, you've outlined with the at this particular point when making time of the essence when you're going to go through and terminate or at least give them some uh demonstrate what the consequences are um and it has been i think it has been writing as well yeah it has been writing too i haven't written that out there but it must be clear that they must perform by a certain time so that at this stage with abishek's building contract it wasn't clear that things were going to be done at a certain time, or at least that it was going to be essential for the thing. Sure, the contract said a year, but it wasn't clear that it was essential that it must be for a year. Remember that if I go over, I'm still going to have to compensate him. But unless it's a condition or a major breach of an anomaly term, you're not going to get the right to terminate. And so this is what happens. If I'm a few days over and you just want to get this other business in to finish the work, give notice. And follow these four things. First of all, wait until I've actually, I'm in default, in other words, I have breached. Make sure you're ready, willing, and able. Stipulate a reasonable length of time in the notice and be clear and unequivocal about what's going to happen if these the, the particular terms that you're referring to haven't been fulfilled by this reasonable length of time. Okay, so Tala, hi. Sure. Okay. Basically, you can't sue in most situations, and um, if the other side isn't going to perform, if you were unable to perform, it's like it's actually quite an old rule of contract law, something to do with fairness, where it seems like a waste of the court's time if um, we uh, have an arrangement. For example, I'm going to develop this land, and you're going to organise the paperwork for, with the council. All right. If it seems pretty silly, if you can't organize the council thing, but I couldn't get the finance to get the diggers anyway, 
um, because what would happen the first person to find out that the other one's in default would be able to sue and that's a little bit from policy reasons not great because then you've got this kind of arbitrary situation where you know you you're, you being in breach is somehow irrelevant to me being in breach and what they say is that look in order to actually rock up and sue somebody you actually have to be able to demonstrate you're actually capable of fulfilling your side of the bargain you don't have to fulfill it but you have to demonstrate that you are not substantially disabled um, so you know for example if the finance was refused and I couldn't get finance then um, to get all my diggers um, I wouldn't be ready willing and able to perform and it's something I would need to prove uh, when I rocked up to court okay now the last slide of this is what happens next consequences of breach this is now uh, as I mentioned these two classifications of terms uh, contractual warranty you gets the right to get dollars contractual condition gives the party dollars like can sue for dollars for damages but they also get this right to terminate but they and again as I'd mentioned they have to if they choose to terminate you can be ready must be ready willing and able now just a couple of things to note that if you're innocent and you can decide that to not terminate in other words the other side is seriously breaching an intermediate term or breach a condition and we've said okay that's okay we're going to carry on we might still sue you for dollars but we're going to carry on keep this contract on foot so for example if um uh with this uh the breach i'd had with abishek's building contract let's just say that notice was given and he says after me being say three months late he said look i'm going to give you another three months at three months that seems like a reasonable length of time I'm going to consider this to be a breach of an intermediate term because you've taken six months over the length of the contract. I'm going to terminate and find someone else. Okay, and you're going to have to, I'll sue you for the um, for the loss that I'm going to suffer doing that. Okay, now assuming that that additional three months comes and goes and Abishek's like, uh, well, it looks like you've almost finished. I'll give you another month. All right, if he elects to let the other side carry on, you can't there's no taxi backsies here at least not for the same breach you can't later on change your mind okay so that that particular point in time if he's letting me carry on then that resets it and usually the things it's a it's in terms of time it's going to reset the clock that particular point in time where you've given me um, and said that you're affirming my breach you, you can still sue me for dollars I'm still going to, have to pay you a whole bunch of money but you can't terminate at least you can't terminate unless you go again and give notice again and map these things out um, and then I fail again to meet that time all right um, just note, note this last that last um, statement of, of law is really important really 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 important why because those tests that I described this test of essentiality and the test with intermediate terms these are things that courts do now you as business people can make the same thoughts about a particular contractual arrangement but fundamentally it's going to be for the court to work it out if everything goes pear-shaped and it needs to go off to court so if you're wrong and this is the hard bit if Abishex thinks well this guy I gave him a year he's four days late I don't think that that's uh, reasonable I'm going to terminate and get my mates to finish the job all right if he thinks that that is a breach of an, that intermediate term but the judge doesn't think that in theory the innocent side is the actually the people who have been kicked out of the contract so this is really tricky it's a really really tricky thing to do you've got to work out using these rules who's um, who is going to get the opportunity to sue who and whether or not you're going to elect to terminate a contract so this stuff I, I wholeheartedly recommend to have a think about that and certainly to go through and ask and um, you know, send me emails and ask questions involving it because this idea of getting your head around um, this difference between conditions and warranties and having this right to terminate and affirming and when you think you have the right to terminate actually going and using it 
because you better be sure, because if you're not, you didn't have that right to terminate because the courts say that, that it wasn't a condition or that it wasn't a serious breach of an intermediate term. You're going to be the one who's breaching in regards to the other side. So they're going to be able to sue you. Um, all right. I'm just going to leave that. There's quite a lot of stuff there to sink in. Yeah. The second one. Yes. So that if... Abhishek, in the case of this building contract, if he, in this situation, didn't have any money, and he wants to terminate the contract and sue me, all right, but he didn't have any money to pay me anyway, he can't do that. Or at least, I mean, he can do whatever he likes, but he's not going to be able to sue me for um, for not being able to, uh, to perform my side of the bargain. Because when you terminate, you're telling the world that the other side isn't doing what they said they were going to do, but I was still able and ready and willing to do what I said I was going to do. If, if you think about this, and again, I was just mentioned this to Tyler before, if you, you know, I, I'm, I'm not able to finish the contract, but you were unable to pay anyway, that creates something of a social policy problem. Neither side is really able to carry on doing it if you think about it. And it seems a little bit odd for the first one to go to court to would automatically win, even if they couldn't fulfill their side of the bargain as well. So the courts have said that, look, you must demonstrate that you are ready, willing, and able to actually do your side of the bargain. In the case of Abishak's building, if he didn't have any money to pay me, right? He, if he can't demonstrate that he was able to perform, I remember his performance for me building his house is this. He only has to pay. Um, usually periodically for building a house. But if he isn't able to do that, usually because he isn't able to get finance, then he's not going to be able to go and, um, uh, and, and terminate the contract, at least terminate it lawfully. So he's just telling me to stop doing what I'm doing, even though he couldn't do his side of it. Um, and so that, that, in theory, means that he's in breach. It's a, it's a, yes. Yes, that's exactly right. Yes, absolutely. You have to prove that you are, it's actually a lower bar. It's not quite that you are actually able to do everything. It's that you weren't disabled. So it's actually a slightly lower bar. Ready, willing, and able means that you have to demonstrate that you, for example, could have got finance. In the case of Abhishek, he would have to demonstrate he could have got finance rather than he actually has finance. He doesn't have to demonstrate he has money. He just has to demonstrate that he was not unable to do it. Slightly lower threshold. It's a lower bar than actually rocking up to court and showing, oh look, I had all this money to pay. Um, that's really the, the the rules for that. I haven't put it in these slides. Um, but that's that's really where that sits. You've got to prove you're not substantially disabled. I don't assess that though. I just use the, the, the phrase ready, willing, and able uh, for, the, for the subject. You have to say, could you have rocked up on the day and performed? If the answer is yes, you're good. You're good to sue. You're good to terminate. Okay, I'm going to leave that because that's that's a lot to, to get through. Um, unfortunately, that stuff needs to sink in um, uh, relatively quickly. So we're going to stay probably at the end of this class. We'll do some examples though. But I'm just going to take, I'm just going to get some water uh, for my voice. So I'll just turn my little webcam off and I'll be back in. Uh, it's quarter past now. We'll, we'll come back at 7.20. Okay, cheers.
Okie dokie. So the, those first two areas that we've looked at, there's two broad umbrellas. Discharge through performance, besides doing what they say they're going to do, plus a couple of little exceptions to that. Then you've got discharge through breach, where one or sometimes both sides have not done what they said they're going to do. Okay, and that's um in both of those situations, you, you've got rules that you can do to try and work out how and where the contractual obligations end. Now, in many ways, repudiation is quite similar to breach. It's a particular kind uh, of breach, and there's, there's really there's two two words or two phrases you have to, to use here um, because repudiation is just the the broadest it's an umbrella term to describe uh, the type of conduct from one party where they're demonstrating either an unwillingness or an inability to be bound by the contract or to substantially perform it okay so repudiation is the name for that conduct, and uh, that's that's one term you need to know. There's another term you need to know called anticipatory breach. They're, they're kind of related, but they, you do need to know that this term anticipatory breach, which is in a couple of slides down, is where one side is demonstrating that they're not either willing or likely to perform uh, a particular term before the time of performance. Okay, you see, you just need to, um, you don't have to think too much about those. Just know that each of those words has that particular meaning. So repudiation can happen either before or after um, some or all of the terms actually needing to be performed. You can repudiate a contract before its time of performance for some or all of the, the terms. Um, but anticipatory breach is referred to particular obligations and that ha where the actual time of performance hasn't come up. Okay, because in some circumstances, you can terminate a contract even though the time for performance by the other side hasn't actually happened yet. Okay, so that just just make note. But uh, yeah, sure thing, Nathan. So the, the, these two concepts or these two con 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 contract law terms we need to know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> There are two two words or phrases in contract law. Repudiation, which is the first uh, phrase on the, the slide there, is the umbrella term for conduct where one side demonstrates an unwillingness or inability to be bound by the contract or substantially perform the contract. Okay, so that this... So we've got to test to work out whether or not that's going to happen. That comes from that uh, COMPAR2 uh, Local Aboriginal uh, Land Council. And you have to just note that that term, very unfortunately, this term is sometimes mixed and matched between another term that we use later called anticipatory breach. And an anticipatory breach is the term we use to describe where it looks like somebody is not going to be able to perform at the point in time, but that point in time hasn't actually happened. If the point in time has actually happened, that's actual breach. That's the previous umbrella uh, category we're talking about. It's really easy to do that if they have actually breached. The rules are a little bit trickier if the time for performance hasn't actually happened. You can kind of see why. Contract law is about two parties coming together, having a meeting of minds to exchange promises, to do what they say they're going to do. And it seems a little bit counterintuitive to make one person be able to get the right to sue the other one if the time for this other one, the time to perform, hasn't come up yet. It seems almost a little bit unfair. But also appreciate that you know, these rules are made in the height of ye old British Empire where they want people to make contracts and do what they say they're going to do, but in situations where one side's clearly not going to be able to perform, it's pretty stupid to make the other side rock up to the date of performance and then, great, they get the right to sue because that's stupid because you might have had suffered great loss up to that point. And so there are some rules that we you can use for, um, uh, and they're kind of related for when the other side uh, is either looks like they're not able to perform or looks like they're unwilling to perform. Uh, 
obligations under a contract. So just make note, this test here for repudiation is where the conduct of the other side would... Nathan, yep. Yeah, term. Yeah, that's right. Well, I don't know if you if you were to go into a contract. Remember, if you go into a contract and you breach it, you the other side always gets the right to seek compensation from you. If you if you go into a contract, and this is why it keeps you at a really high uh, high bar. If you go into a contract, you don't do what you say you're going to do. The other side gets compensated. They get going to get compensation, and we'll go through the rules for compensation shortly. So it's rare that you'll um, you'll go into a contract knowing you're going to breach. I mean, that seems kind of pointless, really. It's like, why don't you just give them the money and save the whole contract? To, you know, save us the, the need to go through the court system because you're going to have to pay them eventually if you're going to go and breach. So this test, though, um, for these two, we've got these two terms, repudiation and anticipatory breach. We'll talk about that in a second. But repudiation, the definition of this, is where to a reasonable party in the position of the person, the innocent party in this situation, whether we think that the other the other guys have either renounced all obligations under the contract, or they've uh, renounced what we they're um, that they're going to perform a contractual condition, in other words, a serious term of the contract, or they've demonstrated uh, a clear unwillingness or inability to substantially perform a series of warranties. So a series of small terms that's going to amount to a serious failure. So if there's um, a, a, a bunch of, of contractual warranties still to be performed under a contract, the other side saying, we're not going to do all of these. That's repudiation. All right. If there's um, some terms that still haven't been fulfilled, one of them is a condition, the other side demonstrating they're not going to fulfill that condition, that's repudiation, or if they're unwilling or un, un, uh, or unable to fulfill a series of warranties, non-essential terms amounting to substantial uh, serious failure, that's going to count as well. I'm sorry, guys, that this is a. Um, because if there is a lot of non-essential terms, all right, and so let's just say that we've got um, 10, con uh, 10 contractual warranties that are still to be fulfilled. All right. So let's just say you from this point, uh, Hina, you're going to say, look, I'm going to do eight of these. All right. But I'm still going to fulfill these two. Okay. At this point in time. But I'm just, I'm just not in a position or I don't want to um, carry on doing things. Now, eight contractual warranties might amount to be a serious failure, even though it's not, strictly speaking, all of the obligations left under it. Whereas, if there were only, say, th you know, three um, small, minor terms, contractual warranties left, and you weren't going to fulfill any of them, that's going to be repudiation as well. Okay, the repudiation, because the thing is, if one side repudiates, the other side gets, uh, gets something, which I'll get to in the, in the next slide here. Um, there we go. Oh, okay. I've got some more rules for that. Simon, what is confusing me yeah. is that um, in the last slide, previous one, um, oh, the test. The test. Yes, I'll go back to the test. Like, it says the first one is saying all obligations and the third one is saying non essentially. Yep. But it's still a serious failure. What I am having in this mind is that mm. it's non essential. Yes. But then it, it's still a serious failure and the first one is saying all obligations. Mm. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, look, I, I can see why. I can see why. I think that's a fair question. Um, it's really just to do with the numbers, though. So if you've got, uh, again, if we think a, there's a, say there's a contract and there's, say, there's 10 warranties and there's two conditions, two major terms. All right. If I've gone through and I'm performing this contract and I've not uh, at the certain point of time, for example, I've run out of money. All right, so it's not that I I'm un um, you know, unwilling 
uh, to, to do it. I can't. I've got an inability to go through and do that. Now, assuming that these things are there, I am going to um, uh, the, the, having this this un, inability to carry on performing the entire contract um, means that I'm repudiating it. Repudiation doesn't have to be something that I'm doing deliberately, although it can be. If I say to you, I don't want to do this anymore, that's repudiation. Um, if I say to you at this point, this renunciation of all obligations, if I don't want, if I just say to you, I'm not going to do this anymore. All right. Uh, or if I demonstrate an unwillingness or inability to perform a contractual condition. That is going to count as repudiation. Sorry, I, I think I've realized that when I've done this, this unwillingness or inability to essentially perform, um, this is actually the same as this. So these ones here, when it says renounce, uh, renunciation, it's demonstrating an unwillingness or inability to substantially perform either everything still left under the contract, which could only be a few minor terms, remember, or to um, demonstrate a clear unwillingness or inability to substantially perform a contractual condition, in other words, a major term, or where there are a bunch of things left, so let's say there's 10 minor terms, and I'm demonstrating an, an unwillingness or inability to, to not perform a bunch of those minor terms, those warranties, that can be repudiation as well. Um, and so that, that uh, you know, I guess the most straightforward or structured way of doing it is when the other side just says, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, that's easy. That's absolutely easy. This, um, this when it's an express uh, repudiation of the contract. We don't want to be bound. Or more, more often it's, hey, uh, we can't do this anymore. Um, we can't. And that's that moment where you're like, okay, that's repudiation. So that, that from that point in time, the other side can get a variety of contractual sort of rights that come with that. Um, uh, you know, that, that can be pretty common. People actually find that it can be um, easier to repudiate, give the other side the right to terminate, Okay, and the reason for that was like, why would you ever do that? The reason it comes in later in this lecture is actually to do with the way damages are calculated. Because once you've done that, the other side has to take reasonable steps to mitigate your loss. Seems a little bit strange. The innocent side has to actually do stuff to mitigate, they have to take reasonable steps to mitigate the other side's loss. So sometimes this can actually happen. And you guys, as business people, again, this this particular topic is really worth going over a few times until you've got these things into your head. I think it's it's assessed multiple times as well, certainly in your test, uh, which is, again, you guys open tomorrow. Um, but it's also in... Um, uh, it'll, be, it'll be in your examination. It'll be in your first assignment. In fact, it's possible it's in all of the... No, no, uh, no it won't be. It won't be in the, um, the take-home exam, but it'll be in the others. Um, so it's definitely worth, for this material, uh, going through and doing it. Because, it, look, to be honest, it's also... This is the you know, bread and butter of business. And if you guys are involved in strategic business decisions in... Uh, look, I'll say in common law jurisdictions, um, you know, Australia and, and uh, the UK and so on, like, but even in places like India as well. Um, and a lot of places, by the way, have taken the old British common law rules and codified it. Um, so that uh, in places like Italy, they've gone and taken these things. If Enrico's still there, they've taken these things, these rules, and put them into a code. But if you go and delve through the code, it, it has all of these rules in there. For, um, for repudiation and such like, this demonstration of, of not wanting or being unable to perform things under a contract. Okay, uh, again, there's some rules here to do with um, uh, when you're trying to work out whether they've actually impliedly refused. And this idea of a um, would the words of conduct lead a reasonable person to think that this party did either not intend or was unwilling to perform the contract. In other words, this, um, by them saying, for example, ah, oh, yeah, we're going to finish the job in cans first. 
um, so going back to Abhishek's house, if I'm building his house um, and I've got to a certain point, still before the time of performance, so let's say we, you know, we're, we're two months in, and I've said to him, oh yeah, I'm going to go finish this house in Cairns. All right. Now, strictly speaking, I didn't directly say I'm not going to do your house, but you could a reasonable person would go through, could look at this and say, well, hang on, whoa, whoa, slow down. The house in Cairns is going to take a year to do. Um, impliedly, you're actually repudiating the contract there. And again, the courts will look at a variety of bits of evidence when they're trying to go through and do that and the conduct of the parties. Okay, uh, also a uh, thing where there's an installment contract, you have to take this into account. Again, this going back to the, the shoes example with Tala, if there is a breach with this an installment contract, which is what we'd had with the uh, $10,000 with the shoes, okay, what the court says is that look, um, when you are trying to analyze whether or not a particular breach or series of breaches of contract that's happened. So say for example, one week I've delivered, um, you know, I'm 10 boxes of shoes short in the next or next one month. And then the next month I was uh, you know, three days late on my delivery. What you can do at the point in time where you want to terminate is that you can look at the, the um, what the courts do is they look at the contract as a whole. Hey, 12, uh, what was it, $120,000 contract? Um, what's the likelihood of further breaches? And then they can go through and work out from that point in time is, are these breaches um, really small as a ratio of the entire contract? And are they likely to continue? That's this, this idea of, that's what the courts look at. We call it the maple flock principle. It comes from maple flock and universal furniture. Uh, okay, so it's a lot longer than I thought. It's almost 100 years old. I didn't realize that. Uh, and so these are uh, you know, rules, again, when you've got things like installment contracts, when you're doing things like regularly, you have to go and look at what is this likely to carry on happening or is it just a one-off? Uh, because and again, you look at the circumstances. Did this, is the other side just having a bad month or is it something that is structural? Have they lost you know, one of their major... Uh, suppliers or customers have they you know, have half of their staff been disappeared or something uh, also note that um, sometimes people can read the contract which like I said when there's a particular um, you've got a written contract one side can read it in a certain way and think that that is the right way to be interpreting the contract. Now, they could be wrong, and it's not often. This, this is a little controversial, this thing. It's not often where being wrong about your contractual obligations may actually give you some form of remedy. Well, it doesn't really give you a remedy. All I say is that there, it might not be repudiation. If in situations, quite a narrow set of circumstances, that they have an honest and reasonably held belief um, that the contract is construed in a certain way, um, and they're ready, willing, and able to perform. Uh, in that situation, it might not count as repudiation. It's a little bit tricky. Okay, so what happens? What happens when you are repudiating? Ah, oh, okay. And I've got a slide on anticipatory breach first. Because, okay. The thing is with repudiation is that you get the right to terminate. Now, repudiation after the time of performance is easy. In fact, it really makes no difference if you think about it because the other side's already in breach. So them demonstrating they're no longer willing to bound, sure, they're no longer willing to be bound. But if they're already in breach because the time of performance has happened, you're able to sue them anyway. So it really isn't, you know, so important. I mean, you can demonstrate the court in, in a much more clear-cut way, so it's easy to go through. If you can prove that they're repudiating, they've said, we're no longer willing to do this, it's easier for you in terms of, um, as a business person, if they've demonstrated this, this unwillingness or inability, that's fine. Get someone else in. Assume that, that, that they've discharged their obligations through breach, that's easy. It's trickier, though, if they haven't reach the time 
of performance for one or more contractual terms in the uh, in the agreement. That's when it's a little bit tricky because still, if one side is repudiating, all right, before the time of performance, the innocent party gets the right to terminate. Okay, I'll say that again. If the repudiation occurs prior to performance, the innocent party gets the right to terminate at that point. All right. Now, uh, again, if you are willing to do this ahead of time, so before the time of performance, you have to prove that you're ready, willing, and able to perform. Uh, and most importantly, most importantly, the last rule there, if you reckon that they have committed anticipatory breach, in other words, they've repudiated before the time of performance, all right, if you reckon that's the case, and you say, all right, I'm terminating now, and you're wrong, because the other side could demonstrate that they were able to perform, then you are going to be the naughty one. You are going to be the one at fault. You are the one who's repudiated the contract, and they get the right to terminate and seek damages. Right? They still have to prove they're ready, willing, and able to perform. So it's, sometimes these things come down to the evidence. Who was actually able to do the contract? Sometimes it's neither party. In which case, tough luck. Neither party gets this right. That's why we have this ready, willing, and able rule in there. But the key thing to note is that if you try to, to sue, uh, to, sorry, to terminate, because the other side's repudiating, before the time of performance, this, this anticipatory breach, make sure you can prove it. Make sure you're right, because if you can't prove it, you're going to be the one as a breach. You're the, going to be the one who's going to have to compensate them. That is the um, uh, the the real double-edged sword with this area of law. So it's a, it's important to note because you can use it. These are rules. This is still the law of the land, but you do have to think about here. Give an example. Oh, going back to um to uh, Abhishek's example with his, with his house. Remember he gave me 11 months to build his house? All right, got to 10 months. He's like, that guy's not gonna be able to do it. So he says, look, you're, you know, you've committed anticipatory breach because you're clearly demonstrating that you're unwilling or, or, or unable to perform this contract, either all contractual obligations or a series of warranties amounting to a substantial one, or a contractual condition as part of this thing. In the case of the, the building, you know, maybe uh, putting the roof on and having the thing ready to go. So there's a series of terms there, doing the fittings, doing the roof, doing the other things. If I'm not going to, if it looks like I'm not going to fulfill this in the 11 months, so Abhishek thinks after about 10 months, he's not going to make it. That's all good. But if I can explain to the court, oh, Oh, oh no no no! I, all of my workers. I, I had ten more workers who were coming in on the first of, you know, the first of October. Um, you know, here's their contract. Here's all of the materials which had been delayed, but they were just about to be delivered into Townsville. If I can go and prove that all of these things, I can demonstrate that I was actually able to perform. Um, then Abhishek was wrong. And because he's wrong there, he's the one who's wrongly terminated. And as such, I'm going to be able to sue him because I become the innocent party at that point in time. And that's why you've got to be really careful before the time of formation, making double, double, triple sure that the other side has actually committed this anticipatory breach before the time of formation. You have to be right because if you're wrong, they're the innocent, they become the innocent party, you become the one at fault. Okay. Uh, Abhishek. Okay, one quick question over here. Yeah. So, say for example, when we normally make a contract, like the construction contract, that example we're using again and again, we normally also do make a list of. Uh, Items that we're supposed to, the, the, the brands that we're supposed to use in the house. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's 
So for example, that might be for, to use a certain brand of material, for example, uh, to get the oven, for example, had to be, um, you know, uh, what's an expensive oven? <laughs> one of those Italian ones. Um, and then what's my one? My one is a Westinghouse. So yeah, so that if they've, they've gone and done that, look, you could argue that that's either a condition or a warranty. If it was a condition, which is unlikely for a building contract, um, what might be more like a condition is that this house has to have a, um, a swimming pool uh, or um, this house has to have, you know, f uh, four bedrooms and a carport or this house has to be able to, to, um, to have a certain amount of cyclone protection. Um, these are the sorts of things that end up being conditions there. And, and again, um, uh, you know, demonstrating this unwillingness or inability to perform that when going through and doing this, not putting the swimming pool in or not doing the gardens or not being able to do some of those things or just saying we don't want to do it anymore. But it's really um, uh, the key thing is to do with the time of performance. So that, strictly speaking, the time of performance for all of those is an 11-month contract on the 11th month. The trick is that if... After the 11 month, the other side, uh, you know, I, you're going to be in breach. The fact that I'm repudiating, sure, that'll give you the right to terminate. Um, but you know, by default, the other side's just going to be in breach. So you can get compensation, but you can't terminate unless there's been a breach of a condition uh, or a serious breach of an anomaly term. So going back to that time, like time, timing of the essence. Uh, but if after the time of performance, I've demonstrated that I'm no longer willing to either fulfill conditions or fulfill all obligations or fulfill a bunch of contractual warranties. So in other words, I'm demonstrating an unwillingness or inability to put any of the wiring in the house. Oh, you're going to have to do that yourself, um, even though it was in the contract. You, know, you could make an argument that that's, um, you know, that's, a, that's a warranty. Uh, what about I'm not going to do the finishing, I'm not going to paint the walls, I'm not going to put the wiring in the house. I'm not going to do all of these things, um, or I'm, un I'm unable to because I've, I've run out of money. That's, the, that's usually the more common one, by the way. Usually it's just that one side doesn't have enough finances, or they've breached contracts with all of the suppliers, so they can't get the materials to finish it. All right. If um, it's a series of those, again, it's repudiating contract. You go, uh, with that. And if it's repudiation, you get the right to terminate. Not just the right to um, to seek damages, the right to terminate as well, and go get your third party company to finish the job. That's the the real key difference there. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. So the things get easier from here a little bit. All right. So an easy way to end a contract, by the way, is to say, "How about we don't have this contract anymore?" And you say, "Yes." And I say, "Okay, good." Now, strictly speaking, you actually you actually can't. Strictly speaking, you can abandon it and say, okay, well, let's both abandon it, all right? But if you if you agree to abandon it, strictly speaking, that's a separate contract. What's the consideration that's passing? I'm agreeing to abandon the contract, and you're agreeing to abandon the, the original contract. Uh, so that's the contract for us to abandon is a contract in itself. Okay, so if you stop and think about that, it's actually there's actually two contracts, because if you just shake hands or you think that there's a meeting of minds, it's not an actual contract, doesn't have all the elements, for example, uh, then if the other side comes back later on and say, oh no no, I didn't, I didn't agree to abandon, um, it wasn't a contract. So that strictly speaking, it's actually a new or a second contract you're going to need to discharge. The previous one it sounds a little silly, but it's kind of just the way that contract law is set up. Now, usually when we do these things, we use what we call deeds. A deed, very much. Yeah, you can do that, yeah, Marie. So you can do. So, um, what a deed is is it's basically it's a statutory mechanism for bypassing consideration. You use them when you, for example, are uh, you, you're um, you are solving or litigating matters, so that you can go and say, look, I won't sue you anymore. I'll enter into a deed, we've got a deed of release that just goes through and we will just, uh, this this deed is a contract essentially, just you don't have to provide consideration. Only one side's consideration. I will promise that I will not 
sue you anymore under this. All right, and you go through and in exchange for this, give me usually give me ten thousand dollars. Yeah, they're usually done um, and created independently, uh, and it also overcomes the writing requirement as well. Um, and again, for contractual obligations, again usually you'll do this by deed. It's the best form of evidence. Um, you commit perjury if you enter into a deed, and you, um, yeah, they're dead. they're very, they're a solemnly sworn document. Okay, uh, sometimes you can have a clause in the contract that allows for the discharge of contractual obligations. So you can have a um, a term that says in the contract that says uh, if both parties want to, both parties can agree to to do it. If they, you know, for example, do something, they um, sign a document agreeing and writing, asking to be discharged. If both sides sign it, all contractual obligations discharge or release. That's fine. If you map it out in the contract, yeah. <laughs> the Grand Norm in German uh, and um, the constitutional law, um, not really. No, I mean, you could argue the Magna Carta, maybe. People try it. There's the, the Great Charter. Um, but no, you mean like an ultimate source of all law. Um, Hans Kelsen was the uh, a German philosopher of uh, of jurisprudence. And he wrote that um, when they talk about the Grand Norms, the Great Norm of constitutional laws and the social contract and all laws flow from that but it's a question of philosophy more than in um in the mechanical aspects of business law that's all i do have a podcast if you look up um if you go into my um uh youtube channel i've got a podcast on it. it's pretty heavy stuff um and i didn't have a very good microphone and so the comments are all nice content terrible microphone and it's about 40 minutes long if you want to go through that. It's, I mean, it's, if you're into um, that aspect of philosophy, it's quite interesting to listen to. And it's the most watched video on my channel by a factor of 10. I don't know why. It's terrible. Okay, um, we did have, uh, um, and before someone mentioned this, oh, it was Abhishek's example, actually, this idea of substituting parties. This um, We call this novation. Strictly speaking, it's a new contract. So both parties have to agree, and we essentially extinguish all the rights in the old one and just replace them with rights in a new one. Because, as we know, a contract is a meeting, meeting of minds between two people. So it's okay to go through and do that, create a new part, a contract between the, these things. And um, my consideration for entering to this is to take over you know, all of the rights that were incurred and obligations of the previous ones. Okay. So can we say that the first one is not going to be released? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. You can. Yes, you can. Um, just note that you... Um, yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, you can. They are very, they are very, very similar. Uh, novation is a subset, essentially, of um, of discharge through um, agreement. So it's just one particular type. Because both parties can, you can have a contract where both parties decide to create a contract that says we no longer have this original contract, and it's a subset of those is that we create a contract that discharges all these obligations, and then a third party takes them over. All right? Yes, you can go through and do that. That that is how that works. So yeah, good spotting there, Ramhina. Okay, oh, this one. This one, I actually don't, oh, Steve used to teach this a lot. I've, I've reduced this to a single slide, which is hilarious because this particular year, the doctrine of frustration is very, very relevant. And I am probably missing an important point on this, but I will talk about them in turn. So there is a rule of ye old contract law, it's actually relatively recent, to be honest, even though it's, it seems like an old rule, that goes like this. If some event happens, some usually some major event happens, and that is unforeseen by both parties, is not the fault of either of the parties, and radically changes the, either the mode of the performance or um, destroys the underlying subject matter, all obligations for a contract from that point onwards are discharged. So I'll say that again. If a supervening event 
that neither party foresaw and wasn't the fault of either party, um, either completely or radically alters the mode of performance of the contract or destroys, fundamentally destroys the subject matter. It discharges all contractual obligations from that point going forward. Okay, this is called the doctrine of frustration. So this idea of discharging through frustration, again, it's, it's usually this is super, super rare. Not so much this year. Why? Exactly. An event that has radically altered the mode of performance for a variety of things. It's, uh, oh, I'd like to say, it probably is unforeseen. Um, and it's either destroy the subject matter of a whole bunch of, con of contracts. You know, you can't fly anymore. Uh, you can't have a festival anymore. You're not allowed to. You, you can't do all of these things. It's been a very unusual... Ah, oh, that sounds, that sounds so. I'll, I'll talk the, um, I'll talk about the quiz after the end of the, this lecture. So we'll stay. We've got about, yeah, I think you might find that the quiz is actually a little bit easier than the, um, than the test. You might find it. It's a little bit, the practice test was actually is reasonably hard. I'll go through the answers for the practice test after this. We'll do that. Yes. Yeah, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is noticeably harder. And I, I think that, uh, look, um, I really wanted you guys to get to the habit of, of, of doing it, to see the style more than anything else. Uh, but it is a little bit hard. I suspect if I gave that to the undergrads, that, uh, well, the senior ones might be all right, but the new ones would, start, would struggle. Okay. So there's one thing that I haven't put in here. I don't know why, actually. I think um, it's just by, um, oh, by mistake more than design. And that is something called a force majeure clause. Force, F-O-R-C-E, M-A-J. Oh, why don't I type it out? I'll just type it out. Force A force majeure clause is a special kind of contractual clause that says if a supervening event happens that fundamentally alters the performance of this contract, this, 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 and this are going to happen. So basically the doctrine of frustration will only apply if the parties haven't mapped out what's going to happen. Um, and so that, that's why... While I say the doctrine of frustration is particularly relevant this year, it is for a variety of um, uh, for a variety of contracts, um, and it's not to say that people won't get a remedy. Uh, and so I've uh, has anybody paid for parking at JCU? Paid for a parking permit because I may be getting the person who gets involved in this the um, the president of the student association. I was just messaging him oh, a couple of days ago. They're trying to get uh, the JCU to reimburse this and. Uh, I sadly had to give some quite bleak pieces of uh, piece of advice that um, it's going to be more more begging than threatening than saber wielding to get money back from that. Um, and the reason is that often co those sorts of contracts actually have terms in them that say if there is a flood, a tornado, a plague, a, a, you know, a pandemic, that the following steps need to be taken or the following things happen. Um, and so they can map it out. And we call that a force majeure clause. So that's, um, just make note that this is only if there isn't a force majeure clause. So I'd mentioned actually, um, I'd mentioned earlier, Taylor and Caldwell. Um, this is what's also called the doctrine of impossibility. Um, that was where at the time of forming the contract, all right, it's the time of forming the contract, if the, the, Taylor and Caldwell was the music hall case where it burnt down, and there the court said that, look, if this happens, the, the hall burnt down before the contract was formed. That's common mistake. We did that last week. If it burns down afterwards, arguably the doctrine of frustration could apply. 
um, and it said contractual obligations from this point forward are discharged for all parties. Okay, things that have already been done have been done. Things that haven't yet been done are discharged. So again, it's not to say you can't get some sort of remedy or compensation for things, but you're not getting it under contract law. Um, contract law is easier to go through and get than some of the other stuff at the end. Okay, uh, and sometimes the, the cases seem a little contradictory. So Corell and Henry, for example, uh, Corell and Henry and Hearn Bay Steamboat, these are what's called the coronation cases. They were heard at the same time, Oh, wow, yeah, in the same, uh, you know, one after the other. And uh, the coronation of Edward III, I think it was, was due to happen. So Victoria had died, Queen Victoria died, and they were trying to work out who the you know, new king was going to be crowned. See, this is something that hasn't happened for a long time. And the um, uh, the what had happened is that uh, in Crowell and Henry, a room was booked that overlooked the parade. So somebody paid a fair amount of money for a room to overlook the parade that was going to carry on. And there the court said that, look, in that situation, the coronation getting cancelled because the um, the new king had appendicitis. So it got put back two years. Uh, but because of that, um, that, that frustrated. The fact that this parade wasn't going to happen, it frustrated that contract. So the person didn't have to pay. And that is contrasted, very sadly, with Hearn Bay Steamboat and Hutton. There, for the exact same event, there was going to be a regatta and all of the boats were going to be uh, around. And so the, this guy Hutton had um, booked a trip to go around and look at all of the boats at this big regatta. And there they said the contract wasn't frustrated. And the reason for that was um, at that point in time, the boats were all still there. You could go and look at the boats. They're not going to have a regatta, so it's, it's different to what it would have been, but you still get a boat ride. Um, those two cases can't easily be um, uh, uh, reconciled, uh, to be honest. Um, it's kind of, it, it, it's a difficult thing to, um, to go through and map and manage because they do seem to contradict each other um, quite badly. Yeah, yes, they were the exact same event, the coronation of Edward the Third, and the Ed, the coronation event got cancelled because the uh, he got appendicitis, so it got put back two years, and so there were two cases that went to the king's bench. I didn't even realise they were like one after the other, which is I find hilarious. Um, and so that in in Crowell and Henry, the room that was overlooking the procession, they said that was frustrated, but they said that the guy who was going to view all of the boats in the regatta could still go and view all of the boats. The boats were all still around. It just wasn't going to be a regatta. Therefore, it wasn't frustrated. So it sounds... But the guy was also doing for the same reason. The same event. The same event. That's right. That's right. I know. I know. I know. It seems crazy. But that is actually how that, um, how that mapped out in the end. And that's why those two cases, they... Um, contract law students have been wrestling with those two ones for uh, well for 100 years 117 years uh, unfortunately because they, they seem to contradict each other so, hey it's the same event but there the um, the courts look what they were really trying to say is that, that for that second one it didn't really go to the heart of the contract that the guy could still go out and perform most of this thing and still get a fair amount of value whereas the other guy would never uh, the guy getting the room would never have got the room he'd never ever would have gone there if that wasn't a thing. Whereas the other guy probably would have gone on a boat cruise. Um, uh, similarly with the, um, oh, what's an example? Oh, future performance. Now there is a rule here. It's actually a pretty important one from this case called Fibrosa. Spruka, oh, I cannot pronounce it. And, and Fairburn Lawson. This is a, one of many cases involved the war. Uh, in this case, the Second World War. Um, and so there uh, involved a shipment uh, and um, where money was paid. There was a deposit paid, but the rest of the money wasn't depa wasn't paid. And the court talked about this. And they said that, look, in very narrow circumstances, um, usually future performance is discharged. So in contract law, you've got no remedy. However, you can recover money that's paid if and only if there's a, what they call a total failure of consideration. In other words, you've got absolutely nothing from it, from the, from the contract. If you've paid money, 
and then the contract gets discharged usually it's all future performance is discharged so you have to use other areas of law to try and get your money back um, the laws of restitution for example which we'll do later in this lecture um, the one exception to that is where there is a total failure of consideration where you've actually got and received absolutely nothing um, as a result so if the war broke out you paid the money and the war broke out and absolutely nothing was given to you you can still use this principle of the total failure of consideration to get your money back um, but uh, yeah I think I'll probably leave that I'll leave, I'll leave that particular point in that because we're about to move on to talk about remedies um, so we might just take I don't know, take, I'll take maybe four minutes that's four minutes should be about right I said I'll go get um, some more uh, more drink and uh, I'll be back soon and we'll move on to, to talking about remedies for the um, uh, for the next part so we'll be I'll be four minutes Thanks guys.
I did forget the last slide on discharge, which has got it up there. Uh, some of these are going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, when you become bankrupt, which we do in the final lecture of this subject, um, your, all of the contractual rights you have are actually vested in another person. Um, they call the trustee in bankruptcy. So that person at that point gets to sit in your sh shoes and sue and be sued in the position that you were in. Um, similarly with liquidation, which is the same thing as bankruptcy, but for companies, um, the directors are kicked out and replaced by liquidators, whose job is to go through, carefully run, keep running all the businesses and to sell off assets to um, uh, return money back to shareholders. Um, there's some old, 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 old rules to do with um, changing the contractual doctrine uh, document itself. Um, they're really rules of evidence and that if one side is going through and literally going and changing the contract, that will just end the contract uh, when you go through and doing that. And in, um, you know, in some of those situations, it can be criminal as well because it can also be fraud. Merger is an unusual um, rule. Again, these, these things don't come up very often. That's when you obtain the rights. So um, that can be, for example, where you've got um, uh, a parent, uh, two companies all right, this company has a lease or something with another one, and this company ends up buying this one. All right, so then you've got you can have sort of situations, or or even um, or when you've got a, a lease hold arrangement with something. If you, if you have a lease, that's no, this is a better example. Um, if you have a lease on a building, and then you end up buying that building, yeah, it's consolidation. That's what happened. But the thing is, the law won't let you have a lease and own. The, build, the building itself. You can't. You can't lease things to yourself. You just can't. You can't create a lesser grant um, other than through some, some statutory mechanisms. They call that merger. That discharges a contractual obligation between the two. Uh, finally, uh, through operation rule, the really important one though is limitation period. So you've only got, um, you get six years from the right to sue arising um, in contract and in tort. Um, so those things can discharge contractual obligations. I'll just, Hina. Uh, oh, I'll turn my thing off. Um, no, no, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's merger. It's a very look. It's I actually didn't. I, I don't think of thing I taught this last year. It's a very very minor rule. It means that if you end up somehow acquiring both sides of the contractual rights, you remember that contract is between two parties, All right? One party A and party B. If you end up acquiring those rights somehow. So if you've got two of those things, so for example, if there's a lease and the lease through the statutory mechanism, leases can be on sold to others. So if you lease it to somebody, then they on sell it to somebody else. And then, uh, you know, the, and then that person ends up buying the original property. You can't have a lease. If you own the lease and you own the property, you, you, these two things can't coexist. It, um, they, they just can't in our legal system. I said it's a, this doesn't come up very much. It really doesn't. I, I, I almost feel bad mentioning it because it'll pr probably never come up in your entire life. Okay, there for the sake of completeness. Uh, now, Abhishek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, we have discussed bankruptcy, liquidation, yep. uh, unauthorized alteration, yep. merger, limitation periods, but we have not discussed uh, uh, acquisitions or takeover. I mean, uh, well, the reason why, yeah, the, that was the reason why I didn't, um, I didn't carry on with that example because the thing is, when you take something over, it's still they're still separate legal entities, so you can have a parent company and a child company, and you can contract w the parent with the child. You can still do that. That's not actually merger within the meaning of this particular very narrow corner case in contract law. It's if you did that, for example, and then you assigned all of the rights back to the parent company, which you could do. You could do it through a statutory mechanism to assign rights, but you can't assign obligations. You can only assign rights uh, to a contract. So if there were only rights that were still accruing, accruing um, to the child company and the child company decides to assign those rights back to the parent, 
All right. So if there's only rights left, then the um, then those rights, in theory, the rights and the obligations are all hold, held by the parent company. There's no the contract ceases to exist. You can't hold by the both the rights and the obligations under contract. You just can't. Um, but yeah, you like said they're real corner cases. That's why I wouldn't I wouldn't labour too much on it. But it's not merger within the meaning of acquisitions. That's all. It's a different. It, it, it's the same word, but it's not used in the same sense. Okay. Yeah, it's a. It's, it's the. It's the merging of contractual rights and obligations under a contract, which is quite rare that that happens. It has to happen in only a few circumstances, such as the assignment. You're allowed to assign contractual rights under a statute, under things like the Property Law Act. I don't talk about it here. I haven't talked about it because it's 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 it really it's actually part of property law rather than contract law. But in theory, if you assign rights, because you can you can't assign obligations. I can't say, oh, there's my friend Lana here. She can do this contract. Um, that's you, you can't do that. You can actually assign rights, things like income streams. You can assign under status under statutory framework. If you end up having both the rights and the obligations for a contract, you can't they, they, they merge. They just disappear. You can't have a contract with yourself. Um, so it's it's only yeah. So that's it. So normally you can't form a contract with yourself. So merger is only where somehow after a contract's been formed one party has ended up with both rights and obligations under it somehow through some area of law, some other area. Okay, that's pretty said. So it's a narrow... Hmm? So are we saying that uh, in case of a merger or a public acquisition, yep. uh, if, if, if the party, that the, the, party uh, the company with which I had a contract is it taken over by a, a bigger company, hmm. do they have the right to rework the, or renegotiate the terms of the contract? Uh... You're not renegotiating it. You can create a new contract because you, if you're the head company, and let's say, and you and you've now bought a pair, uh, you know, now control a child entity, they're still separate companies, even if you control them, so that you can still have contracts between those two. Oh, somebody's on. Um, somebody's got funky music. I think it might be Abhishek's there. Okay, so you can still, um, when you have this, they're still separate legal entities. Parent and child company can still contract with each other. That's fine. But you, through some forms, and I said, these narrow corner cases under statutes where uh, rights are assigned, where you say, okay, we are going to enter into um, you know, a written assignment under the Property Law Act that assigns all rights to this contract up here to the parent company, if they're assuming that there's no obligations still outstanding, only rights, then the parent company has you know, the duties and the rights, so they just merge, they just they, they just disappear at law. That's how it discharges. I said, I'm not gonna labor the point too much because it really, it's an incredible corner, it's a, it's a corner case, it doesn't come up very much. Um, I didn't explain it last year and I feel bad explaining it this year. All right, what is important is this. Because it turns out people care about money when others do, um, you know, when you enter into contracts and the other side breaches, uh, you are always entitled to compensation. You're always allowed um, some form of, uh, of what we call damages as a result of that. It's an order by the court to pay some amount to the other as compensation. Now, we also talk about later on uh, in, in this lecture, so ooh, later on, about half an hour's time, uh, some what we call equitable remedies. Very, very unusual situations where the court can grant certain remedies where dollars actually aren't adequate. Or in situations where there's no actual contract that's formed or that there's no breach of a contract. So I'll explain what I mean by each of those when we get to them. Well, we'll start with looking at uh, the... Um, damages because this rule remember I talk about the top 10 things I always say that this is my number one this is my absolute number one rule in contract law it's called the principle in Robinson and Harmon and if you ask a law student what the rule in Robinson and Harmon is and they don't know tell them that they need to go back to law school it's of fundamental importance because it goes like this if one side 
breaches. The other side is allowed to get what we call damages, all right? But the purpose of these damages are designed to put the innocent side in the situation that they would have been in if the other party, the naughty party, the one that breached, did what they said they were going to do. So I'm going to say that again, maybe twice. In contract law, when one side breaches and the other side is entitled to damages, to put them in the situation that they would have been in. So you, you really need to run that through your head many times. It is of fundamental importance because this is not what lay people think the way contracts work. And it is also not how damages and tort work. Most people think that damages put you back to where you were. And it does work like that in tort. So if somebody injures you, there's negligence or there's been a battery or something similar. That's not how it works in contract. So for example, if um, uh, uh, Sukhpreet has got, um, is for example, uh, supplies ice cream to these cruise ships and I'm an ice cream manufacturer and we have a contract where I'm selling in boxes of ice creams at $10 a box. All right. And we rock up at the, um, uh, for the place of delivery on the strand for him to swap into his fancy truck that goes straight out to the cruise ship. If I rock up and I've only got half the amount that the contract said, all right. And like I said, the ten dollars a box, and I've only got five hundred boxes instead of a thousand. Okay, so let's just do so. Do some quick numbers. This is good because this is you guys are you guys are accountants. You don't mind mind this bit here. So let's say the contract was for a thousand boxes, and I'm selling them to Sukpreet at ten dollars each. Sounds good, right? This is pretty logical, sure. But I've only delivered five hundred boxes. All right, so I'm in breach. Sure. Breach, 500 boxes. When we're trying to work out how much money I have to pay him, what's going to be the relevant consideration? What's the relevant thing we have to think about here? If he gathers 500 boxes, that would mean a lot for the, you know, to use the... Re yeah, complimentary. Mm, no, no. Go back to this rule. All right, Sukhpreet, in this situation... He's got a he's got a contract with this cruise ship, and he's going to go take my ice creams and sell them to the cruise company on board. What's the really what's the key piece of information that we're missing? How many people are on board? Um, it's not even so much how many people. We'll just assume that he could sell all of them. How many that I was supposed to give a thousand boxes? If we're supposed to, to right? yeah, I'm in breach. I've breached the contract. Nope, nope, we've got to work out. There we go, this is good. This is a good start. I'm glad we did this. Because this this rule, that's, yeah, Marie's got it. How much money is Sukhpreet going to make on those boxes? $40? $70? We don't know at this stage. What if he's making $100? He's got this amazing contract that he's been telling the world about. What if he's got $100 per box? All right, me not rocking up with this extra five hundred dollars. What's that going to cost Sukhbrit? That will be the profit in the in the five hundred. You have to five hundred less the profit on the other five hundred. That means you have to give him four hundred something. Exactly. It's the um. It's exactly. I spelled exactly right. See, there it is. It's all to do with opportunity cost. Look, all these things need to be proved. But the thing is, the really key thing is. When the court's trying to work out what the damage awards are, you start with the principal in Robinson and Harmon. How much money does Sukhpreet need to be put in the position, the, the same position they would have been in if I did what I said I was going to do, which was to rock up with a thousand boxes. So if these boxes were being sold for $110 each, right? And again, there's some other things we've got to do to test this. Um, 
then I'm going to have to compensate him $50,000. Yeah, you do those sorts of numbers. You realize why contract law can be a really important thing to learn. My $10,000 contract, um, I've been in breach and only delivered half of it, is, may end up costing me $50,000. Because I must put him in the situation he would be in if I did what I said I was going to do. That's the starting point for calculating damages in contract law. And that is not intuitive. Most people don't know. Absolutely, Abhishek. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, again, these things have to be have to be proved. But yeah, that's right. If these things, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, I know. Well, that's that's just it. When you enter into a contract, don't do it lightly. Now, don't get me wrong. There are ways of limiting the things, but that is the starting point. That is absolutely the starting point in contract law. It's the principle in Robinson and Harmon, and it is harsh. Yeah. Okay, for example, you, you, you are talking about IT, you know? Yeah. Now, we have changing IT to safe mark, but now, you know, some people have <sighs> profit. If the profit is 150%, I love it. You know? I love it. <laughs> That's a mean, huh? I have even, uh, it's that I don't take money, but I have to give him even money. Yeah. Um, yeah, face masks. That's a. Um, it's going to be an interesting. Um, we live in interesting times. Uh, uh, toilet paper is even the funnier one in Australia. Um, my friend Lani was. There's a picture of her looking so happy that she managed to go through one of the shipping companies and snuck into the back and got a big bag of toilet paper. Uh, probably on sale it in the black market for a hundred dollars. Okay. So yeah, Abhishek, please repeat the question. Oh, the question for the earlier question was: uh, Sukbreed has um, a company which supplies ice cream to the cruise ships, big cruise ships coming in. So he's put an order with me that says I want to buy a thousand dollars of of your ice, a thousand boxes of your ice cream for ten dollars each. And I rock up with only five hundred boxes. All right. So he, at this point, again. If, Ceteris Paribus, if nothing else happened, I would have to compensate for breach of contract that we can calculate what we, what we call the expectation loss. So he would expect to make $50,000 from this. Well, again, less the amount he'd have to pay me of 1000 so $49,000. Um, and so that is huge. It's a huge thing. It's absolutely huge. It's a massive, massive point. It's huge. It's a. It's. I can't stress this enough. This is not an intuitive rule, but it kind of is. If you actually start to think about how contract law works, it's about people, you know, solemnly going into agreements, making agreements, and doing what they said they're going to do. Tala. All right. So if we're talking about suing for damages for the position that I was going to be in if I had this contract, let's say yes. an example would be that my reputation as a supplier of face masks, like Anita was saying, has been damaged, and this damage is going to cost me future revenue and loss of uh, 10,000 customers because I have a bad reputation. Does the person still pay me the damage of the loss of reputation? I'm just seeing if I can find the damages, the bit on reputation. Uh, yeah, here it is. It's about five slides further down. There is a rule for that, and we'll get to it. Okay, so that's the starting point. Now, uh, this next one here is it's really to do with starting to do calculations. Now we get to put on our accounting hats and our, our uh, um, economics hats. Usually, I've got to say, from this point, this is the point where the accounting you guys do better than the law students. They're really bad at this. They're really bad. So there's a couple of things. Look, it falls into two, there's two broad categories because when we're calculating stuff, the example I had with um, Sukhpreet's was something that could be calculated. We're going into this, the amount of profit he's going to make is something that can be calculated. All right. And again, 
this is what we call expectation damages. However, if you can't calculate it, you can only get what's called reliance damages. And unfortunately, that is putting you back to where you were. Uh, so the examples here, um, Commonwealth and Amman Av Aviation, uh, this was a, a plane, a company that had planes. And basically, they got a few um, uh, contracts with the Commonwealth government. And there was this likelihood, though, they were going to get many more. So that the first few contracts were only for like one and a half million dollars. But they went and spent, thinking they were going to get more contracts, they spent five and a half million dollars on planes. All right. And so the, 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 um, and the Commonwealth, when they, they pulled it and they said, no, no, we're not going to do any more contracts. Uh, the courts were then trying to work out, well, when you're calculating this, um, should, you know, the, 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 the Commonwealth said, oh, you can only get stuff which has been outlaid um, towards the original contract. And no, the court said, no, actually, that's not, um, that's not how this is going to work. It was reasonable of them to think they were going to get multiple contra contracts, but you still couldn't really calculate what the amount is going to be. Um, and so in that situation, you still got to have what's called reliance damages. Uh, but in that case, they were happy to, to, for it to be all five and a half million dollars for the extra planes they'd bought. Now, you might remember this case from last week, McRae and the Commonwealth Disposals Commission. That was the guy who was a, a salvage operator and the CDC um, sold him the right to go and get oil from a tanker off a reef that's where a tanker, oil tanker had sank during the Battle of the Coral Sea. And it turns out there was no tanker and in fact, there was no reef. And so there, the court said, well, look, sure, the, other, the CDC's in breach, but you can't work out how much money you would have had. There was no oil tanker. So you have to go back and work out what you actually reasonably incurred up to this point as compensation. Okay, but when you're trying to work out this compensation, again, all of these flow from the principal in Robinson and Harmon from that previous slide, by the way. It's about putting people as far as money can to where they would have been. Sometimes though, you can't calculate it. So you have to put them back to where they were. All right, now, if there's a chance uh, uh, for a... Um, if there is a loss of some chance for some prize, and the Chaplin and Hicks is the best example of this. This guy, Seymour Hicks, was a very famous actor. And Ms. Chaplin was uh, put into a beauty pageant. So she went the first round of a beauty pageant and she'd paid a sum of money to win a potential prize. And what they said, and completely through the fault of Hicks, she didn't go into that final draw, so she wasn't eligible for it, and it was for like a thousand pounds. And what they said is that, look, in situations where you have a loss of chance, we'll just use a bit of microeconomics here. If you had a ten, if there are ten people, we're going to assume you have a one in ten chance of winning, so you're going to get a hundred pounds in that case, one tenth of the total amount. It's pretty logical, really. And um, the same with How and Tiffy. That was a racehorse that turned out to be lame. If you can prove what the winnings of the horse is likely to be, you can seek compensation for doing that. Now, again, harder for me to prove that I'd have a 10% chance of winning a beauty contest, maybe easier for others. Um, but the courts, usually for things like that, they don't go too far into the evidence. Usually they'll just pay the fraction. So I would have the same chance as anyone else in the class of winning a beauty contest. Um, Uh, usually, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Reliance damage is usually for things, uh, uh, anything that you've reasonably outlaid as in, in fulfilling the contract. So it's your outlays, not your profits in situations where you can't calculate your profits. Okay, so this is the key thing. If you can calculate the profits, you get expectation damage. That's the high one, usually. If you can't calculate the profits, you can always get reliance damages to put you back to where you, where you were. Okay, so that, that all of these things require you to be able to prove things to the court. It's all about this aspect of proof. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, now there are three things that you need to note in terms of damages. All right, three things that essentially curtail or reduce the likelihood or completely stop the, the um, chance of getting damage awards. Those three things that reduce your damage awards are the test for causation, 
mitigation and remoteness. So we're going to go through each th of these three things. I'm just about to change it here. So the first of these is causation. All right, and when you are trying to prove harm or loss in law, you must prove as the plaintiff a logical connection between, in this case, the breach, so the cause of action, which is the breach, and the loss itself. And this is just the same as when we do tort law in two weeks' time, where uh, for something like the tort of negligence, we have to prove harm, and we have to prove that the breach, again, in terms of negligence, caused loss to the plaintiff. Here we have the same thing. We have to do this proof of causation in order to for each particular packet of harm we're seeking compensation for to actually be able to get money back from the uh, from the other side. And in contract law, the test is pretty simple. We ask, would the plaintiff have suffered the loss if the other side did what they said they were going to do. In other words, would they have suffered this harm but for the other side's breach? Okay, that's a very, very simple crude test um, that doesn't take into account some sort of multi-factor analysis of multiple causes um, and isn't actually the test we use in tort either, at least not strike list, because in contract, <laughs> they very unfortunately, and this is the only time ever I've seen this in law, they use a test for common sense as well. And so in, um, uh, okay, in a couple of these things here, um, Reg Glass and Rivers Locking System, good example. Uh, Rivers Locking System, oops, sorry, Rivers Locking System w was in charge of, um, yeah, back now. Reg Glass and Rivers Locking Systems was a case involving a company that made uh, doors with locks. And they made a, um, some doors with some locks and the locks weren't very good and so the burglars got in and the um, and the argument was that oh we didn't cause the loss the burglar was and well the court said no that's not the test the test said would the harm have come but for your breach in this case if the locks worked properly the burglars couldn't get in therefore you're in breach okay that's the first bit now, um, the second case here, Alexander and Cambridge Credit, um, comes up again for mitigation too. That involved a finance company uh, that borrowed some money and they had received some sort of some bad advice in terms of investment. And they, um, basically what happened is that they, they lost some money. This is back in the 70s, I think. They, they'd lost a, a bunch of money. And then the market turned and they, carried on trading and so instead of losing 11 million dollars they end up losing 120 million dollars and the um and the courts there said that look you you have to take it you know, was the negligent advice from the auditors um uh you know would the harm have come but for the loss and there they said that look um strictly speaking the negligence advice of the auditors did actually cause that loss. And we temper this thing with a common sense test uh, as part and parcel of that, that you do have to look at the uh, the underlying circumstances um, and think, well, is there is there like a chain of events that happened that's just far too long so that um, that an ordinary person, which is what a common sense test is, uh, wouldn't think that one caused the other. Um, so in contract law, we, we sort of combine those two tests. We say that, look, normally it's a but-for test. Um, subject to common sense. In other words, does it just look wrong? Um, although hilariously, in Alexander and Cambridge Credit, they said that that actually was fine. All right. And by the way, if you don't prove causation for any particular packet of harm, you can't claim on it. You can't claim that harm unless you can prove it. You can't prove that a particular packet of harm was caused by the... Um, uh, by the defendant, you, you can't claim that packet. All right. So the next thing that can reduce your damage awards is was what's called remoteness. Um, that is this idea that, look, you can't, in contract law, 
be compensated for things um, if, when the other side breaches. They were so far removed from the original um, event. And the original event, the very important thing about contract law is that unlike tort, where we're looking at the time of breach, a contract law, we're actually thinking about the bargain. We're thinking about at the very, very start, would the parties have contemplated things? And so here they say, with remoteness, um, you you can't claim the things that are, are too far down the way. Uh, and so that in Hadley and Baxendale, for example, where this um, this rule comes from, it was a, a mill, a mill that needed its crankshaft. You guys know what a mill is? It's a big wheel that turns and grinds flour. And it was a crankshaft, which is the big shaft that goes in the middle of it. And they gave it to a transport company and said, oi, go and get this fixed. And so they did. They went off and fixed it. They said, oh, you know, this contract said, oh, don't take more than five days. They ended up taking 11 days. And they said, okay, sure. Um, it turns out when they, when they came back and got sued, the mill didn't have a replacement, which seems insane. And so what the court said there is that, look, when you're trying to work out whether or not uh, loss was too remote, in other words, with the transport company, when they're entering into this contract, is this something that would have, have uh, you know, that the parties would, would fairly and reasonably have foreseen either as something that's a naturally occurring consequence of the breach, or if that doesn't apply, at the time of formation, is this something that the parties might have contemplated as a probable result of the breach? So you've got to have one of those two things satisfied in order for a particular packet of, of loss to be um, not considered to be too remote. In other words, to be able to, uh, to claim that. Um, and so there with the, with the mill, with the crank, they said that, look, there's no way that the transport company would have seen this loss from taking the extra bit of time is something that arises naturally. There would be no way that a mill like that would not have a spare um, crankshaft. The, the whole operations weren't there. And so, and they said that, look, it's also not something in that situation that the parties might have contemplated as a probable result of the breach either. Now, also note here that, look, if where it says it, with that second limb of Hadley and Baxendale might have been in the contemplation of both parties is different from things that are actually in the contemplation of both parties because the parties actually talk about it. You can't argue that it's too remote. The parties talk about something and say, oh, well, um, for example, yeah, yeah, you better be quick because uh, we don't have a spare crankshaft. You're never going to be able to win. It's not going to have... You're not going to argue that this was too far removed or remote if you if, if the parties actually knew about it. Um, so that's the um, the second component of this. Now the um, the third ones, each of these things is a little tricky, a little tricky to get your head around. Um, so I do recommend going over this oh, multiple times. Um, the second one is to do with what we call mitigation, or the third one, sorry. And mitigation occurs where there is a breach. So going back to this example with um, Sukhpreet, uh, with the ice cream the ice cream truck going onto the cruise ship, all right? Now. In theory, Sukhbrick could just turn around and sue me for $50,000. Do we think that's a good idea as in terms of social policy for him to be able to, to, to throw his hands in the air and say, oh, that's fine, I'm just going to be able to claim $50,000. And I think for this, the purpose of, of brevity, I'm going to say, no, courts don't like that. It's inefficient for people to be able to sit on their contractual rights and not carry on performing stuff. So what they say is that, look, while you can do that, you have to take reasonable steps to mitigate loss to the defendant. So in this case, Sugpreet, even though I'm at fault, would have to take reasonable steps to avoid the loss. What would reasonable steps be if he needs another 500 boxes of ice cream? Hina? Kuyen? Marie? Anybody there? Yeah. Nice one, Francine. Yeah, exactly. Find another supplier. Go and get some more. Go and get some more boxes. And the thing is, reasonable steps mean you can go and get boxes. They might cost a little bit more money. That's okay. You might have to go and buy them retail from Woolies. That's okay. The difference in terms of the extra you have to pay, you can claim back off me. 
but you can't just throw your hands in the air and do nothing. Or at least I mean, you can, but the courts are going to reduce your loss, uh, the amount of money you can get, if you could have re, um, actually gone and mitigated that loss in some way. Now, what you can do, those are the, the, the great three ways of, of your damage awards being reduced in contract law. Um, what often happens though, and it, this is much more sort of reasonable, is that the parties usually ahead of time agree to dollar amounts. What if you can't find it? If you can't find it, you've taken reasonable steps. And in fact, the time and effort that you spent and the petrol and the wages you pay your staff going to find those ice creams, you can also claim from me. Taking a reasonable steps. Um, so that this, but this part here is interesting because this happens a lot commercially. These are what's called pre-estimated damage clauses. And they're different and distinct from a penalty clause. So if you have, and as um, I used to get a, read power bills back in the 1980s where they say, if you don't pay this power bill by this length of time, we're going to add $100 to it. All right. What they've realized, losing a lot of cases, is that that doesn't work very well. What they're in fact going to do is say, oh, how about instead, we'll say we'll give you a 10% discount if you pay by the due date. And this is the ordinary amount. See how what I did with the, with the phrasing of that language? The reason why we phrase it like that actually comes from this area of law. So the idea is that you can agree in the contract how much money is going to be paid if the other side breaches. So going back to Abhishek and me with the house, we could have a, a term in that contract that says, for every day that I go over, I have to pay $500. All right, and the courts... Basically, if that amount is reasonable, that is the amount the courts will use. All right? If it's not reasonable, the courts won't use it. They'll just work it, work it out themselves. All right. So um, the, and the, the two terms that we use here, the two words, phrases we use is a, a pre-estimated damages clause or a liquidated damages clause. All right. They are reasonable. They are fine. They are okay. Penalty clause, though, is where it's too much. And again, this rule from this Dunlop pneumatic tire in your garage, um, they, they went through and analyzed that. And they said that, look, if um, the amount is large in comparison with the greatest loss that could happen. So say, for example, going back to the example with um, uh, with me, with the ice creams, with, uh, with Sukhpreet, if there was a penalty clause that says, that, look, um, in this clause, Simon, if you, for every box you don't deliver, uh, you pay me um, a dollar. All right, that's probably a reasonable amount. Okay, it's not extravagant, it's not unconscionable. All right, but um, if, however, the amount that I had to pay was $200 per box, all right, that's extravagant and unconscionable in comparison to the greatest loss that could conceivably be proved to have followed from the breach. He's never going to sell these boxes for $200 each. Um, and uh, they also notice that it's far more likely to be a penalty clause if you um, uh, if yeah, if if the breach is no non-payment and the amount that you have to pay is a massive amount, they, they look at that and it's more likely to, to call that a penalty clause. And if the amount that you pay is the same for all breaches, serious breaches and small breaches, much more likely the courts will look at it and say, this is not a genuine pre-estimated damages clause. It is actually a penalty clause. And they strike it out and use their own logic for determining the, um, the dollars. Now, um, a, a particular type of pre-estimated damage clause is a deposit. All right. Just make note, this case uh, with that stock loser and Johnson, they worked out a deposit is usually about 10% of the full contract amount. If it's a um, uh, a fair amount, so again, doesn't really exceed more than 10%, um, and the, you know, the, the mechanism for forfeiting that deposit is sort of fair, the courts are happy to uphold those. Uh, I'm sure, yeah, we don't use the word escrow, that's an American English term, and for American law, we use the word trust. And deposits, not strictly speaking, trusts, they can be. Um, but I'll talk about that when we do trust law. If, if you remind me, remind me for that um, 
that specific question, um, uh, Abhishek, when we, when we do trust law in a couple of weeks' time, and I'll go over that, because there, there are rules, but we haven't got time now. Um, and just know, equity can actually intervene um, if, the, if it's un, unconscionable uh, and the deposit is, is about to be, um, uh, the deposit's about to be forfeited. Okay, there's some other things that restrict damage awards. Um, hurt feelings, you can't sue for hurt feelings. Contract law is cold. Contract law is not, does not care about your feelings. You don't usually get damages for um, discomfort, disappointment, or distress. Again, it's it's tough. It's a tough world out there in business. Baltic Shipping and Dylan, they actually, she was awarded that because there's one exception and for all three of these, because you don't usually get uh, damages for loss of reputation either. There is an exception for all three of these rules, and that is if the object of the contract was to increase or make your feelings better, to provide for um, comfort and, to, and your happiness, in other words, something like a holiday, or it was to enhance your reputation. So if the fundamental purpose of the contract was to fulfill those things, um, Baltic Shipping and Dillon was a, a, a cruise and the boat sank. And so there they did award damages um, for that, for the discomfort, disappointment, distress, because it was a holiday. It was supposed to increase your um, your well-being. Um, Flamingo Park and Dolly Dolly, uh, they looked at loss of reputation. There they said that, look, if this was something like a marketing company, so if you're paying a marketing company to increase your brand and it ends up reducing it, sure. If your reputation gets lost, yes. Yes, the breach can be sued in that situation. Um, I'm not going to worry about those rules there. I'll talk about that when we talk about tort. All right. I'm going to whiz through these guys here. Um, basically, as well as the, um, the rules in common law to get damages, there are also some extra rules in some narrow situations where damages are either impossible or inappropriate. Um, so that, that what, what does that mean? It means in some situations where the, the particular thing um, needs to be handed over or one party needs to be stopped from certain parts of conduct. Um, and just note, you don't get this by right. This is always discretionary. The court always gets to exercise discretion uh, when they're awarding these things. They take stuff into account, but you don't always get it. Equity is all over the show. All right. Uh, so specific performance is the name of a term. It's nothing to do with discharge by performance. It just happens to have the same word. Very unfortunate. Specific performance is a very particular remedy that says in some situations, the other side will be forced by the court to do what they said they were going to do. And there was one situation that may have come up in the lives of anybody. Has anybody here bought a house? Marie? Or Henna? Have you, have you guys bought houses? Yep. yep. Okay. Wait, do, if, was it in Queensland? Yes. Okay. So when um, when you're going through and read the contract, of course, we all carefully go through and read contracts. Oh, good. And Enrico as well. Um, when you read it, there'll be a clause in a standard purchase of residential property that says um, or, or governs the rules for specific performance because you usually only get specific performance, in other words, the court making the other side do what they said they're going to do, if the subject matter is somehow scarce or unique. So Ming vases, for example, or um, Dugan and Lay was taxi licenses. There weren't very many of them. All right, so you bought the taxi but they didn't want to give the license. And they said, no, we're going to use specific performance to compel you. And because they say there, it's only when common law damages are insufficient. Okay, if dollars, if money's not enough. And the one time where this does always come up is with land. All pockets, packets of land are considered to be unique. So specific performance is open for purchases of land where the other side doesn't want to go through with the contract, just wants to pay money. Well, no, sure you can get money, but you can also ask for them to convey that property to you as well. You're always allowed, to, or at least to ask, for specific performance for those things. Usually, um, though, there's some restrictions on specific performance. They're not going to give it if it's going to create hardship. The whole principles of equity is designed to... Um, to try and you know find some sort of uh, justice where things have fallen through the gaps of common law, because common law doesn't provide an adequate remedy here. 
um, it's not available when it's not equally available. To play. In other words, uh, when you're trying to exercise this, one of the parties is a minor. So a 17-year-old can't actually ask for specific performance because, as I mentioned the other day, talking about contracts for necessities, um, minors, if they were buying something like a diamond ring, it's not a necessity, so the other side can't enforce the contract against them. So oddly, well, maybe not oddly, they can't um, uh, get an order for specific performance in those situations. Um, it'll never, ever, ever, ever happen for contracts of personal service because that's akin to slavery. It's getting the court to make someone do something. Um, or that's going to require constant supervision. So in other words, the court would have to go and check that the other side was doing this all the time. The courts are not going to do that. They're, they're just going to find that um, uh, that damages, dollars are going to have to, have to do in that particular uh, situation. Okay, an injunction it's kind of like specific performance, except it's not making somebody do something, it's stopping them from doing something. These have broader application than just contract law, so you can get injunctions to stop people from defaming you and for all sorts of things. You can get what's called an interlocutory injunction, which is before going to court. Um, and really it's to do with usually enforcing things like um, restraint of trade clauses, if the other side just carries on doing it. You've got a contract with them. Um, for example, I have a contract with, um, with Michelle, and she has a contract with and in the terms of the contract says, Simon, once we finish this, you will not work as a software developer in Townsville for the next three years. All right. Next day, I go straight to a competition. She can go to court and ask for an injunction, stopping me from doing that. You, the court uses its inherent powers to grant orders preventing people from doing certain things. Um, that's what how and where injunctions work. It's pretty rare that you get that in contract. Okay. Um, so injunctions and specific performance are remedies in equity. And so a couple of th things apply for that. It means that the doctrines of equity apply. Um, you can't, um, can't go to equity with what we call unclean hands. If you're trying to, to really to screw over the other side, at the same time you're trying to seek an equitable remedy, the court won't give it to you. It's discretionary. You have to do justice. Okay, um, restitution is a separate remedy. Before I talked about the fibrosa case, um, you can get this where money's been paid either accidentally or there's a total failure of consideration. In other words, absolutely nothing was supplied. So a contract was made, total failure of consideration, money's been paid. You can ask the other side for that money back. All right, and the court has the power at common law to, um, uh, to order this. I mean, it kind of makes sense that uh, you, you know, if somebody, you've given money in mistake, or you've had a contract and they've literally supplied you with nothing. You don't use the rules for breach. You can just ask for an order and restitution just to get that pocket of money, packet of money back. Um, I've bought a motor. Uh, this is a case that I looked at just um, oh, relatively recently. Uh, a guy in Western Queensland went to buy a motor uh, of somebody, paid the money, had, and then the motor never turned up. Went to QCAT and they said, here, total failure of consideration. All right? There, no motor was given. And so that, that is a total failure. Therefore, the, the court there, again, use these, these rules, can order that money to be paid back. All right. Um, and again, going back to this idea of courts being div, uh, contracts being divisible, we talked about that in the first or second slide, second slide today. Um, all right. Uh, another one we can look at. Next one. Oh, the last slide. Oh, good. Oh, okay, that's good. We'll move on to the test soon. Two minutes, two. Uh, quantum merit is a um, is a doctrine. I think it's an equity as well. I'm not sure. I have to check that. Um, either way, oh no, it's discretionary. It is an equity. Yes, um, it's for where you've done um, when you, when you've done work, and it turns out that there wasn't a contract. Both sides thought there was a contract, but there wasn't. Um, that can either be because we've uh, started negotiations. One side started working, and then the actual formal contract never actually happened. Um, or it can happen where one side works. Um, we think that there's a contract and we think that one person owns some land. All right, so one person thinks, and so, the other, and so they've, they've gone and built a house on somebody else's land. You can use this to get a reasonable amount back for the labor which has been, and the materials that have been exerted, um, used up in that case. Um, and just note that if you're in breach of contract, you you don't get that. You don't get quantum merit um, if, if you're in breach when going through and doing it because it's a discretionary remedy and you can't be... It, it, quantum merit and breach just don't sit in the same sentence together because it's 
it's a discretionary remedy that only applies where there isn't a contract. If there is a contract, you use the contract. And the rules under that. Um, you're not going to get um, uh, damages in quantum merit. Okay, uh, sorry that that was a lot uh, of material for a short space of time. So I'm going to talk about the test after that. So what I'll do, I'll stop this recording. I'm going to stop the recording now. Quick as well. Yeah, quick as well. Okay, here we go. So I'll stop this recording here. So guys, I'll turn the, um, the live stream off, guys.